all persons have been business before the Honorable Chief Judge and Associate Judges, now presiding of the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, draw near and give your attention. God save this United States and his Honorable Court. This Honorable Court is now in session. Please come to order. order. Good morning and welcome to the District of Columbia Court of Appeals for our uh, oral arguments today. We have three cases before the court this morning for oral argument. Um, the first of which is In re Larry Kleiman. Following this first case, the court will take a brief recess to reconstitute the panel for the remaining two cases. Um, as counsel and parties are aware, um, each side uh, typically has 15 minutes for oral argument. And uh, we generally try to be a little bit understanding in light of the time. Uh, if questions take you slightly over that time. Um, on behalf of the petitioner, um, um, uh, Mr. Link, are you ready to proceed? Uh, Your Honor, I'm ready to proceed. The Office of Disciplinary Counsel is uh the appellee here, the uh, respondent, Mr. Kleinman, has taken an exception to the board's report. But, I do, have a question, but yes. I do have a question for the court before we begin. How many people are representing the respondent and speaking for respondent in this matter? I noticed three. Yes, we, uh, we, I'll clarify have... that for you, Mr. Link. Um, the, the panel has determined upon the request of Mr. Kleinman um, to allow him some time for oral argument along with his counsel, Ms. Isik. And so I'm going to ask them how they plan to divide that 15 minute time frame. Um, and is it Ms. Is, am I pronouncing your name correctly, counsel? Sorry, Your Honor, it is Isaac. Okay, um, good morning, Ms. Isaac. How do you and Mr. Clayman propose to divide the time? Um, Mr. Clayman is going to argue first. I'm sorry, Larry, are you, you're muted. Your Honor, okay. I apologize, I was muted. Um, I'm going to argue first for 12 minutes. Ms. Isaac will have three. Um, Mr. Clayman, um, before you uh, proceed, I just wanted to um, respond to Mr. Link's inquiry. Um, technically our court rules, and I imagine this is what you were going to raise, Mr. Link, um, indicate that where a party is represented by counsel, that counsel will conduct the arguments on behalf of the party. Yeah. In, this case, in this case, Mr. Kleiman um, has requested some time for argument. Um, and so Mr. Kleiman, um, um, we'll, we'll allow you a portion of the time, and then we will ask Ms. Isaac um, if she will provide some additional argument. Your Honor, I, I also mm -hmm. note that there's a third party from uh, the respondent side listed here, Mr. Anderson. What What is his role in this proceeding? He's my executive assistant, Your Honor. He'll be putting up on the screen a couple exhibits. That's the only reason. Um, Mr. Kleiman, we don't uh, put up exhibits on the Court of Appeals. Okay. So, okay. Mr. Mr. Anderson, um, um, if he's not counsel, um, and since we won't be hearing uh, or considering exhibits, that is something that has already taken place. Um, we would ask that Mr. Anderson uh, please exit the virtual court. Okay, that's fine, Your Honor. Also, it was my understanding, looking at prior cases, that we would get a three-minute rebuttal. So since we're the- well, It's not in addition to your time. So okay. if, you take, if you like to take about seven minutes for your argument and reserve your three minutes for rebuttal, and then we can hear uh, from uh, Ms. Isaac, okay? Okay, well, let's, I'll see how it goes, how quickly I can get through it. Okay, well, we, as I said, we, we do have time limits and we'll try to be uh, gracious in hearing you, but we don't have unlimited time. Understood. Are you ready to proceed? Yes, I am, Your Honor. If you could state your name for the record and your, your position in this case. I'm the respondent, Larry Clayman. I'm appearing pro se along with my counsel, my co-counsel, Miss Melissa Isaac. Your Honor, nothing that I say here should be taken as any disrespect to this court. I respect this court. I respect the uh, 
the concept of disciplinary proceedings if they're carried out fairly. I myself started Judicial Watch back in 1994 to kind of be a hamburger helper, you know, to the bar in terms of promoting ethics uh, in our legal system. This case is in its 12th year. I've been under temporary suspension for 16 months, and there's only two months left in terms of what was recommended by the board for suspension, which was 18 months. There's no basis for the board to have recommended reinstatement. In fact, in a prior case, uh, in June 2020, I cite this in our briefs, the board found, excuse me, this court found, more importantly, that we are not left with serious doubt or real skepticism that Mr. Clayman can practice ethically. Accordingly, we declined to impose a fitness requirement. This came out in June 2020 during the COVID pandemic. Nothing has happened since. I have not practiced in the District of Columbia during the last 16 months. Mr. Clayman, I, I, with respect to that, that was a determination that the court made on a record that was created in connection with that disciplinary matter. And this case arises uh, on a different record. And so the determination that the court made based on, you know, and, and that you're, is it reflected in the decision you're referring to, um, seems like uh, uh, it wouldn't necessarily shed much light at all on whether in light of the additional determinations and uh, findings and recommendations in this record a fitness requirement is warranted. It's sort of like saying, uh, uh, you know, if, 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 if uh, somebody has two criminal trials and they got, uh, you know, acquitted or found guilty of only certain charges in one that they, in a second trial, obviously they must not be uh, responsible. Uh, there, there are different proceedings, different records, different alleged misconduct and the like. So I'm not sure I follow yeah. You're attributing to that. Well, here's 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 what's important, Your Honor, is that this case is 12 years old. Okay. And as you're gonna see, I'm gonna ask that you thoroughly review the record. Uh, and we're, we're gonna get into that. The hearing committee, uh, in my view, was was very biased, and the board basically accepted what it said without a review. But I'm gonna get into that. It wasn't a bona fide review. Well, the Mr. Bottom Mr. Line, can I ask a specific question? Um, um one of the violations that the board found in this and the hearing committee found in this matter before us today was a violation of rule 1.4 B um, communications um, um, with the client and keeping the client um, informed. And um, part of the basis for the board's finding of the violation was um, the, the nature of the communications um, and the, the personal relationship that developed between um, you and AS, the uh, client here. Um, um, and and the, the, their view that that unreasonably um, colored all other communications. And that, that basis is sort of, as I think you argued or your attorney argued, a strained interpretation of Rule 1.4b. Um, but ultimately, um, the board found other bases under 1.4b where they determined that you had not adequately informed or communicated with your client. Um, uh, that's, that's not accurate, Your Honor. And number one. What, what's not accurate? That they, their findings? Or what, the board, what the board found, okay, recommended rather. Okay, that's not accurate is that there's no such thing as an ethical violation on the basis of emotional interest. In fact, the key witness in this case, Tim Shamble, who's head of the union and represented Ms. Sataki along with me, testified clearly as to the constant communication and consent that she provided to the actions that we took. And the, the fact that I actually cared about her caused me to work harder. Mr. Shamble testified he'd never seen anybody work that hard. And he even recommended other- If we were to agree with that part, of, uh, with you, on the aspect of the board's finding, uh, essentially they determined that because of your uh, personal relationship with AS, that, that that may have clouded your other communications. They also went on to find other independent bases to support their finding of the rule 1.4 B violation. I, um, so specifically they said that one of the findings was that you did not in advance 
inform your client of your filing of the motion to disqualify a federal judge in, in her case. Um, wouldn't that separate finding be sufficient for a violation under Rule 1.4b? No, because, Your Honor, number one, she was informed, and you have to go back. The transcript of what occurred is extremely important. Viewing the findings of fact and conclusions of law where I key in the admissions that Ms. Sataki made during her testimony. And remember, I had seven witnesses. The only material witness that was provided by ODC was Ms. Sataki, and she was impeached on a number of occasions and also found not to be telling the truth. But Mr. Shamble testified that she was fully informed. And besides, a lawyer is allowed some leeway in making the decision, even though she was informed of that. I told her right up front that this judge, Colin Culler Catelli, I had difficulty with in the past, that she frankly does not like conservatives. She was a member of the ACLU. She was opposed by every conservative group in terms of becoming Did a judge. Did you let in advance told all those things. Clients that you were going to file that motion? Yes, yes, I did. Filed it. Yes, I did. And that's zealous representation, Your Honor, is that I wanted it to go before a judge who was neutral, who didn't have any animus towards me or her. Ms. Sataki is a conservative as well. She, her family was in the regime of the Shah of Iran. Would, would your, so your argument is that with respect to the board's finding that you did not consult with your client prior to filing that motion, that that was an erroneous finding. That's an erroneous finding. There are other erroneous findings in the board's decision too, which is why I asked for a thorough review and to actually go back into the transcript and to look at the findings of fact and to see what it is. Because it appears that the board essentially, with no disrespect, rubber stamped a biased recommendation by the hearing committee. People sat on that hearing committee who are my polar opposites politically. We all live in Washington. Did, did, did you move to recuse any of the members of the hearing committee? I did not become aware of Mr. Uh, Tiger's communist background and the fact that he had been removed as a law clerk by Justice William Brennan until the case uh, started to proceed in terms of the argument. And in fact, you know, my counsel at the time, wow. if, if, I, I may, I, if I may finish the answer, if I may finish the answer, would, did not want to put that forward. You know, they appear in front of our disciplinary apparatus all the time. Mr. Clayman, I'm sorry to, to keep interjecting, um, but what would be most helpful to us as we are looking at the specific violations that the board found? We have thoroughly read the hearing committee's record and the board's record. Um, and our task on appeal is to um, determine um, whether there's any basis to find that there was clear error. Um, Your Honor, you have, we to... have to. So we need to, if we could go through hmm. the evaluations, I think another one was based on 1.7. If, if I may add just here, may just interject, Your Honor, you just said you reviewed the board <clears throat> you know, recommendation and the hearing. We review the record before us. I, I, I ask that you review my findings of fact and conclusions of law and go back what in your, the transcript. Your findings of fact are part of your brief. Is that what you're referring to? That was uh, a part of your... Yes, it's very important you go we back. Have all of that information before us. Your Honor, let me, if I may just say, and this is, I, I need to get this out there, okay? And, and I'm happy to answer all your questions. This case is in the posture it's in right now because I was temporarily suspended as I have claimed without due process. We never had findings of fact issued by the court as to why I've been temporarily suspended. There's never been a final hearing. I've already effectively uh, served 16 months out of the 18 months. I have put the court on notice that I will also be filing by July 5th a petition for writ of certiorari and a petition for writ of mandamus with the Supreme Court challenging this temporary suspension. It's nothing personal with regard to, to you judges. I sued all of you in an equitable capacity. Uh, and the fact is, is that I maintain that you never reviewed the record thoroughly before you temporarily suspended me. So when you make reference to the fact that you've read the recommendation of the hearing committee and the board, that's not what 
solely what you have to do. This is de novo. You've got to go back and actually look at the record and look at the transcript and look at the admissions and look at the documents. I mean, why and, do you say de novo? Uh, I mean, I, 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 I would have thought that on, for example, questions of who to credit. I mean, you're right that uh, ES was impeached in various ways at the hearing, as were you. Uh, and uh, the hearing committee uh, was charged with making credibility determinations. I know you don't agree with them. Um, and there's conflicting evidence on some of the topics that the hearing committee made credibility determinations on. But why do you, are you suggesting that we should be making de novo credibility determinations? And if so, what-, what, what I'm not saying you're, you're making credibility determinations. Yes, that's a factor. If you look at the totality of how Ms. Sataki has not told the truth, even to the Office of Civil Rights, they found that she had not told the truth about the sexual harassment. I'm asking you to look at the facts, the admissions that she made. Let me just tick them off and it'll answer the question of Judge Blackburn Rigsby. Number one, uh, she was fully informed every step of the way. Number two, she wanted to go to Los Angeles. So my, my question was very, very narrow. My question was, um, the hearing committee found that with respect to the motion for recusal that you filed in the federal district court, that um, prior to filing that motion, um, your client was not informed. That that was one of their that's, findings. That's not true, and, I, and that's that's completely untrue. And, okay. and, Mr. and Mr. Shamble testified that they were she was communicated with every step of the way. He was my partner in this case. And when it came about that I could not determine because uh, she it was not in her handwriting, it was not in her syntax that she wanted to let some parts of her case go, I tried to get in touch with her. And so did Mr. Shamble. And we couldn't, I couldn't let her rights be uh, lost, you know, as an ethical matter. I could be sued for malpractice for that. Well, so the, the, the hearing and, committee found that there came a time when ES was unwilling to further communicate with you because she had been the recipient from you of, you know, unwanted and abusive emails. Um, and they pointed to various emails that they relied upon to support that characterization. Uh, and uh, relatedly, uh, with respect to the conflict point, the hearing committee found that uh, by, in a way, admissions reflected in emails that you had sent, that your feelings for ES had rendered, I think this is a paraphrase, but had rendered you non-functional as an attorney. No. Uh, so I, I understand that there is evidence that you point to that supports your positions on this, but I guess given our deferential standard of review, uh, it would also be important to me for you to try to address the evidence that was to the contrary that the hearing committee was trying to rely upon. And so I would be interested in your response to those, in particular, those two things. Deference to the contrary was, is that I felt that the relationship needed to move on because it got to the point where she actually asked me to buy her a car a Mercedes car. And also she became abusive towards me. You might see when she didn't get the result that she had hoped for before Judge Catelli, putting her back to work in the Persian News Network. And this is another factual error. Voice of America has a personal news network bureau in Los Angeles. There are a million Persians that live in Los Angeles. I mean, they joke and call it tarantulas. That's how many. Is that when she didn't get that result, she turned on me and accused me of taking bribes and accused me of being unfaithful because I'm a, a Jew and a Christian, Jewish Christian, disparaged my religion. She became abusive with me. Of course, they don't want to talk about that because this was an outcome determinative recommendation by the hearing committee that was never thoroughly reviewed by the board. And in, I mean, it, the board's decision is so flawed that they even said that I never asked for discovery of Dr. Aviera uh, or Sataki. I did early on and I renewed it. Uh, it's simply not correct. Now, in terms of the, of the communication, every step of the way I communicated with her, that's why I was contacting her. In fact, the first complaint that was filed in October of... Uh, November 2nd, 2010, only says that I'm calling her. She wants me to stop. A year later, another supplemental complaint is filed and it's not in her handwriting. It was written by somebody else. We found out at the hearing it was written by her convicted felon cousin, Sam Razavi, who was convicted of gambling fraud in Las Vegas. In that complaint, and this is what I want to put up on the screen, it says that they're filing the same complaint with Pennsylvania and Florida. 
Florida and Pennsylvania dismissed this case, dismissed it early that, on. I'm interested in that, that topic because the record seems very scanty on it. Uh, it, it. There is the indication that the statement that she filed similar complaints. And then, the, the, so I, there is that. Uh, and then there is there are certificates of good standing that suggest that no action was taken, no adverse action was taken. Is there? I, I, it wasn't clear to me what that means about whether those matters were held in abeyance or what happened to them. And I think that would be a matter of public record. It was just very puzzling to me that neither side, hmm. both you and disciplinary counsel, didn't actually, uh, in any clear and direct way, indicate what what the actual disposition of those matters was, rather than kind of by uh, inference uh, from kind of at some indication there was complaint and no indication there was action. Is there First anything all, Your Honor, yeah. about what we don't have more? I'll explain that. First of all, everything else that Ms. Sataki took without actually looking at the record and what she said was taken at face value and accepted. Everything I said was rejected. No mention in the board report of any of my witnesses, including Ms. Mr. Shamble, uh, Gloria Allred, Judge I'm not quite sure. No, I'm getting to that. But she said that it was filed. It was said it was filed. Now, by the time this case was resurrected, seven years later, the Florida and Pennsylvania bars, they keep only disciplinary records for five years. I sought to get it. Documents had been lost in the interim. I thought the case was over. I discarded records. I lost records. I didn't have the records. So consequently, what I put forward was the fact that I have no disciplinary history after these complaints were filed, and I know that they were dismissed, which is why when I was called by Mr. Smith, the prior lawyer of ODC that was handling it, saying, okay, this case is going to be going forward, I said, are you kidding me? I thought it was dismissed because I had no idea after seven years that this thing could proceed as it did. They literally had to hunt Ms. Sataki down to find her. That occurred after Hamilton Fox became Office of Disciplinary Counsel. Uh, the head of it, uh, under the prior uh, counsel, Gene Ship, I was always treated fairly by this. You know, I got complaints before by the Clintons and others, and that's something else I want to discuss here. But Mr. they were always- Layman, can I just um, clarify one thing? When you said you know it was dismissed, how do you know? Just Because I remember seeing the correspondence. I didn't keep it. I thought okay. the case had been over. And you have to accept what Ms. Sataki said in her complaint, go back and look at Exhibit 23. It said it was being filed simultaneously at those bars. So that's how I know that. Now, what's well, important- with, 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 well, the other things, Mr. Clayman, I know we, we have a lot of questions and we have a little bit of- How much time do I have left, Your Honor? Uh, Your many- time on the clock is up, but we are trying to be generous to give you additional time to respond to our questions. Um, one of the findings of the um, board in the hearing committee was a violation of Rule 1.5C, which requires a fee agreement um, and contingency fee agreement specifically to be in writing. Um, was there, a, in the findings here in the record, were that there was no written contingency fee agreement? Was there a written contingency no, fee? There was no, there was not, Your Honor, and, and it never was a contingent fee. I always made it clear that I was doing this pro bono. Was there any written uh, fee agreement, even if it was a regular fee or? or, or no, there were there were a number of emails and you got to go back and look in the exhibits that said, I'm not charging you. Uh, I don't want your money. I myself put out over $30,000 to help her. My, my Mr. Heart- Clayman, here, here again, you're pointing to some, uh, there are some uh, emails that suggest you were doing it pro bono, but there are other emails from you that uh, include like a demand of 50% of any recovery and so you seem to be uh, focused on some of the evidence, but not all of the evidence. Can you address the email? That, that occurred at the end when Ms. Sataki became very abusive and disparaged my religious beliefs and also uh, the fact that I had, quote, taken bribes. OK, and I said, well, if I was going to continue, I said, if I was going to continue, then this is the way it would be. But I didn't intend want to continue. That's why I took her to Gloria Allred and Tim Shea, who she didn't want as counsel. And by that point, the matter, the the, uh, the the representation had ended. I simply was trying to- also, He has also testified that there was an agreement uh, for a 40, initially an agreement for a 40% contingency. I know you think that the hearing committee erred 
in crediting her testimony because you believe that she should not have been credited because she was impeached in various ways. But if you assume for a moment, uh, would you agree that there was testimony by her, that there was, in fact, a 40 percent contingency agreement at the front end? Yes, and it was false. It was false right. testimony. If you look and, at everything, you look at the emails, how many emails I sent, I'm not charging you. I've never, I didn't bring any legal action to get paid. I was not sued for malpractice. I, my, frankly, my heart went out to her and I still have compassion. Okay, people say, I don't, you know, ODC says I don't have compassion. Of course I have compassion, but I've been attacked. My law license has been put in question. I was a member in good standing of this bar for almost 40 years. You know, yes, I'm a strong advocate. Yes, I'm a conservative advocate. Yes, I have sued the Clintons. And by the way, let me add there, with regard, that was a completely bogus finding because, and in fact, the expert of the ODC even said so uh, in so many words, is that to try to coax a settlement, I sued everybody on the board, including my friend, Makita uh, uh, Blanquita Cullum, as well as Dana Perino, you know, who was the press secretary of George W. Bush. This was not discriminatory towards Mrs. Clinton. I was trying to coax a settlement. And that answers this question too, because I never thought that we would get any monetary reward here. If I did, we'd probably all be over hundred years old. I mean, suing the government under these circumstances, you'll probably never see anything. The goal was to put her back to Los Angeles, take her to Los Angeles where she wanted to be, where her friends were, where there was a Persian News Network bureau in Wilshire Boulevard. She told me, and that's in the record, and you got to find it. If I have to go back to the Washington, D.C. Bureau in the Central News Division, I will commit suicide. I can't be there with the alleged harasser. And again, you know, Office of Civil Rights found that she was not telling the truth about her harassment. And they, they interviewed right. a number of witnesses. She was Mr. impeached there, too. We're going to uh, stop at this point and allow Ms. Um, Isaac a minute or two argument and you have reserved a few minutes for rebuttal time and we'll also reserve that time for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Ms. Isaac, is there anything you wanted to say? Yes, just just, just quick. I'll give an uh, over, overview of my argument. I, when I looked at the record and it was, it was pretty clear the decision was not based on the great weight of the evidence. In fact, it shows decision was made upon emotion, I think, rather than fact. And perhaps the most troubling aspect of the case is that Mrs. Sataki was impeached several times, provided no witnesses, and the evidence she did provide was explained and put into context by Mr. Clayman. And the case was ramped up in the midst of the Me Too movement, which thanks to the Johnny Depp trial, that narrative, I think, has largely been debunked. But you know, I've represented countless men who've been falsely accused by women where the allegation essentially becomes the evidence and men's lives, you know, occupational or otherwise, are ruined or substantially negatively impacted. And that's what happened in this case with Mr. Clayman. And really what's telling are her own words. She describes herself essentially as Mr. Clayman's victim. Um, she says that she was rescued from Mr. Clayman. But after she was supposedly rescued from Mr. Clayman, you know, she was homeless. She was essentially destitute. And really, the, it, the admission was that no one else had treated her with such compassion and consideration since Mr. Clayman. But a thorough review of the transcript does show a, a bias against Mr. Clayman. And, and, you know, when men are accused by women, there seems where, to be a double standard. Could you give me where, like, where, to the extent you're suggesting that the transcript shows that the hearing committee had bias against uh, your client, I think. I mean, that's obviously a serious accusation. And so could you tell me like specifically where, 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 where you think that is manifested? I think you have to take it as a whole. If you look at when Miss Sataki made an allegation, it was largely that it was an allegation, but well, Mr. No, Clayman, she, she then I mean, she then testified to it and the board, the hearing committee had to decide who to believe. And I, I, I certainly take your point and Mr. Clayman's point that she was impeached in various respects as witnesses often are, and your client was impeached in various respects, as witnesses often are, and the hearing committee had a determination to make, and your allegation, your client's allegation, is that that determination was infected by bias, um, and that's obviously a, a, a serious uh, claim, and it's difficult to make a whole if you can't identify specific parts, and so I'm just trying to see what specific parts you would point us to as contributing to part of this whole that uh, H W-H-O-L-E, uh, that you think uh, should be apparent uh, if we read the transcript and we read 
the uh, hearing committee's report, which I, I will say I've done. So uh, uh, I, I, I would be interested in where you think that's manifested. Well, I think the biggest and most obvious might be where the the portion of the transcript where she has made allegations that were uh, against for sexual harassment that were found to be false. And uh, it's unfortunate. And I think because in, in our society, and I'm just, I will speak very candidly. I mean, no disrespect. Well, to the I, I mean, I was asking you where the hearing committee showed bias and you're pointing, you're saying that hmm. there was evidence that her underlying claim of sexual harassment was not, uh, uh, uh uh, accepted by uh, later decision makers, and is your, th I mean that that doesn't uh, that doesn't show bias in and of itself. That doesn't show bias by the hearing committee or anyone else. Is your point that, given a determination by some other entity that her underlying claim of sexual harassment was not at, as supported by evidence, um, required the hearing committee to discredit her testimony in total? Or I'm just not quite sure I'm following the step you're making from. A point you're making about the impeachment of uh, ES to bias by the hearing committee. Okay, for uh, for, for example, um, Mr. Clayman was essentially found guilty of violating the trial publicity rules, and that's something that Mrs. Sataki was very supportive of. That Mrs. Sataki handed out um, press releases. I mean, she was very supportive of this, of a, the, making this very public. And in the end, it comes down to what he said. It yes. seems like the form of your answer is in the nature of. The hearing committee must have been biased, not that they showed it in any kind of comments that reflected bias, but because no fair decision maker, given the evidence in front of the hearing committee, could have chosen to credit ES over your client on areas where there are disputes of fact. Is that, uh, uh, is that, the, is, is that what I'm gathering your argument is, or am I missing an aspect of your argument? Your Honor, I think the, the record shows that any time there was a he said, she said, they sided with Ms. Sataki every single time, despite Mr. Clayman being able to impeach her on several other areas. So I, I don't know that, and I for, come from a societal perspective, I don't know that it's uncommon for men to feel a bias when they're going through litigation with a woman, especially when it comes to allegations of, of sexual harassment or sexual misconduct or an allegation of abuse. I mean, you know, I've, I've represented thousands of men and it's not uncommon for the narrative of abuse and controlling to be used by women, essentially. And again, I made no disrespect, but you know, the, the abuse and, and neglect of women seems to be the, the, the fastest way for women to win in court. So when you look at the record as a whole, anytime there seemed to be a he said, she said, where Mr. Clayman didn't have proof positive to show that she was lying, the board seemed to side with Ms. Sataki. There's, the a, a, there's a Supreme Court case called Litech, uh, which addresses the question of when uh, a court will infer bias by, let's say, like an appellate court will infer bias uh, of a trial adjudicator uh, based on what's sometimes called intrajudicial bias. It's like the rulings must be biased because no, uh, you know, there's not like expressions of bias or anything like that. It's just that the rulings inferentially support bias. And the Supreme Court said in that case, that's not an impossible way to show bias, but it's very hard to do it. Um, and uh, uh, w would you agree, I guess, in trying to figure out whether that very difficult? I'm sorry, I, I touched the end. I'm sorry, sir. Would yeah. I agree? In, in trying to figure out whether that, that kind of an inference is warranted here, would you agree that your client was impeached in a variety of respects at the hearing? Not, I think it's apples and oranges to, to the way that she was, she was impeached. And I think we can take what I'm arguing here. And we look at other cases who have come in front of this disciplinary board. You like the Klein Smith case, for example, there are several uh, people who have different political persuasions who have come before the board with, with crimes, with felonies, and they're essentially given a slap on the wrist. And we have Mr. Clayman coming forward with a, a with evidence that of an, untruthfulness on the part of Ms. Sataki. We have explanations and we have things put in context where he provided um, sound explanations for the things that she are saying, and yet he receives a suspension. It seems, it seems much harsher than it would be someone who was similarly situated to Mr. Clayman, but a different political view, perhaps. And actually, I wanted to uh, uh, address one other topic that we haven't touched on yet, which is uh, relates to the temporary suspension, which I know your client uh, objects to and continues to uh, contest. Um, and in particular, it uh, 
relates to the requirement of filing a, 14, a section 14 G affidavit for uh, that temporary suspension to even start running. Um, and I understood you to be arguing on behalf of your client that your client is not required to file a Rule 14G affidavit. Not only, I know your client can test the suspension, and so I guess if he could ultimately establish that the suspension was unwarranted, then perhaps his failure to file a 14G affidavit uh, might be by the by. Um, but uh, I understood your, your client also to argue that as a matter of kind of interpreting the court rules, there is no requirement to file a 14G affidavit for a temporary suspension. Is that your client's argument? Larry, you're, you're muted. No, he's not speaking at this point. But I'm sorry. Yeah, may, I, may I address that, uh, Your uh, Honor? No, you'll have a chance in no, rebuttal. Not, not at this time, but you'll have your moment on rebuttal. Mr. Okay. Ms. Isaac, if you don't have a response, then that's okay. We'll, we'll move forward at this time. Yes, I'll defer to Mr. Clayman on that response, yes. All right, okay. thank you. At this time, uh, we'll hear from uh, uh, counsel, disciplinary counsel. Um, Thank you, uh, Chief Judge. May it please the court, my name is Miles Link and I represent the Office of Disciplinary Counsel. I, I do wanna respond or comment briefly on the 14G affidavit. On March 9th, 2021, I wrote to Mr. Clayman's counsel reminding her of his responsibility to file that 14G affidavit and reminding her that his suspension for purposes of reinstatement with the clock would not begin to run until after he filed that affidavit. That letter is a matter of record. It is now June of 2022, and he has never filed that affidavit. So when Mr. Clayman talked about uh, periods of suspension running, his temporary suspension here has not even begun to run because he hasn't filed that affidavit. And when we talk about the sanction in this case and about a lawyer's fitness to practice, I think that's something this court should clearly take into account. Mr. Clayman has objected to the hearing committee's uh, report and recommendation and the board's report and recommendation on the grounds that they were biased against him. Uh, Mr. Clayman actually objects to anyone ruling against him, whether it's the board or a hearing committee or a judge, and he sues them and he uh, makes disparaging comments about them if they rule against him, because in his view, the decision to rule against him is itself evidence of uh, bias. But here, there is a substantial evidence in the record to support the board's recommendation to this court that he be suspended for 18 months and uh, with a fitness requirement for reinstatement. We know that the board carefully reviewed the hearing committee's report and recommendation because the hearing committee recommended a 33-month suspension and the board looking at comparable cases said 33 month suspension didn't seem appropriate and 18 month suspension, both the hearing committee and the board recommended fitness, disciplinary council recommended disbarment. We think the board's recommendation is a minimum recommendation given the facts of these cases, both the facts as charged in the specification of charges and all of the subsequent events that have taken place in this proceeding. It's important to remember, Mr. Clayman was found to have violated 1.2a, failure to abide by his client's goals of the representation. 1.4b, failure to meaningfully communicate with his client so she could contribute uh, her views to the representation. 1.5c, failure to have a written fee agreement in a contingency case. 1.6a1 and 1.6a3, disclosing client confidences and secrets and 1.7b4, his personal uh, infatuation with his client interfering with his representation of her. And on that point, I refer the court to uh, findings of fact 70 to 77, which lay out his emails to her and her desperate responses as he tried to explain his Mr. infatuation Link, to her. Mr. Link, if I could um, interject with a question. Um, related to the board and the hearing committee's findings on the rule 1.7 before conflict of interest and sort of conflating that to some degree with the 1.4 B explanations. Um, you know, it's essentially 
um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm persuaded by the hearing committee's reasoning, uh, which seems to maybe go a little bit too far, where it determined that um, his, Mr. Clayman's feelings for AS were so strong that they overshadowed any other kind of communication with his client. Um, and, and that finding is sort of used to some degree to dovetail with the board's findings and the committee's, the committee, the hearing committee's findings on the 1.7B violations. That, that seems to be a bit novel and maybe a little bit of a strain about what we typically find with respect to 1.4B violations again. And then to use that to then pile on to the 1.7 um, violations seem to me to be perhaps a bit of a stretch. Chief Judge uh, Blackman, we thank you for the question. In fact, we have testimony from the respondent in the record, in the report, where he said he felt his uh, emotional uh, attachment uh, psychologically disabled him to be an effective attorney for this client. In fact, this client was already traumatized. Remember, she was had retained counsel to prosecute a sexual harassment claim against her employer, and then she found herself being sexually harassed by her attorney. So she was already traumatized. The communication between her and, 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 and uh, this respondent became very strained. And she was she there is repeated evidence in the record that she consistently tried to bring him back to what she wanted in the case, not to sue extraneous people. Respondent says he sued the board and its members, uh, including the former Secretary of State, because he wanted to get a settlement. She specifically asked him not to do that and to withdraw that suit. He continued with that suit. So you clearly have a 1.2a and the 1.4b follows from that. They were not communicating effectively with respect to the representation. The okay. Make sure I understand. It's the so I, I think it's it was the the I thought it was the board that had this theory about 1.4 B, which was not so much. I mean, the hearing committee, as I understood it, said there are three specific topics where he should have communicated with her and he did not, and he went ahead and did things anyway, and that was a failure to communicate. That was the the hearing committee's 1.4 B analysis. I thought. Yes. And rather and accepting, like saying, yep, we agree with that, the board took a somewhat different tack I, I, as I, I read it. And so um, this is on page 16 over 17 to the, uh, the board's uh, report and recommendation, where the board doesn't actually say, here's a topic that he didn't communicate with her on. Um, and instead what the board says is, um, uh, you need to communicate in a way that allows the client to make decisions. Uh, um, he was communicating her, you know, so nothing in the board, nothing in the board's analysis that I saw said, here's a topic he should have communicated to, with her about that he did not. Instead, it was, he also was communicating to her at this, you know, uh, uh, in a lot of inappropriate ways that were, uh, you know, that had to do with his feelings and not to do about the case. Um, and that she, you know, was not receptive to that. I don't, I, I mean, that's later or, or elsewhere in the board's conclusion. But it says, this isn't really the typical rule 1.4 by a violation, the board says, but this wasn't the kind of communication that you ought to get. Um, and then in light of the inappropriate communications and his intimidating and berating manner of speaking, his communications were drowned out. And that seemed, you know, it's a kind of metaphorical, I guess, and somewhat unclear. It, uh, uh, you know, so it doesn't seem to rest the board's analysis, it doesn't seem to rest on there was a topic he should have discussed that he didn't, which was the hearing committee's analysis, seems pretty straightforward. Um, uh, instead, it is, even if he said everything he should have said, he said some other things, and that isn't like the kind of communications you should have had, and it, again, drowned out, in some metaphorical sense, the communications. Now, I'm not sure I think that it would be impossible to, to, to say, uh, if a lawyer's communication, it, you know, sends 20 emails and in there somewhere is all the information that there should have been. But there also is so much abusive or inappropriate material that the client won't read them and ends up saying, don't, you know, I'm not gonna, 
I can't, re I'm not receiving this anymore. You know, don't contact me further. I guess you could say that, you know, that, that, that there in fact wasn't communication because, and maybe that's what the board meant speaking metaphorically about things being drowned out. Because I know there, you know, there's some evidence that might support that way of looking at it, but it just seemed like a somewhat novel and metaphorical approach to all this rather than what seemed like a more straightforward approach by the hearing committee. You're, you're muted, Mr. Lane. Excuse me. Your Honor, I think it's important to first note that the board accepted and adopted the findings of the hearing committee. So they are included by reference in the board's report. The hearing committee report is 183 pages. It is meticulous. It is comprehensive. And yes, they addressed in detail issues that the board, having already adopted that report, did not feel a need to address. Interestingly enough, the board report focuses on the 1.4B communication. The board report on page, on page one says, a lawyer's ability to communicate with a client is at the heart of the attorney-client relationship. So that, uh, uh, that's the, wh where they start. And then they say on page two, in respondent's own words, his quote, emotions had rendered him non-functional even as a lawyer. And therefore, the board says, as a result of his emotional attachment to his client, he lost the ability to effectively communicate with her. So yes, the board is taking the board is looking for an explanation for his failure to effectively communicate with her. And it discusses at length that, as you pointed out, Your Honor, on page 16 and 17, its view that it was his emotional attachment that impeded that ability. We may agree or disagree with that. I think there's substantial evidence in the record to support the board's conclusion, but both the board and the hearing committee, which delved into this in, in great detail, concluded that for whatever reason, his, his, his communicating effectively with his client to tell her what was going on, what needed to be done so that she could participate in making decisions. Remember, that's the purpose of 1.4b, to allow the client to have enough information to communicate. If he's, if, if he is, and let's use the metaphorical term, if he's obscuring the, 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 the bandwidth with other emotional uh, uh, effusions, that will impede his, <laughs> the information he's communicating to his client. And so I that thought it was interesting. I want, to, I want to tap into a word you used a minute ago, which was comprehensive. And it, it's true, the hearing committee report is very detailed and, and lengthy. Um, but I, there are two aspects of the word comprehensive I wanted to ask you about. One I hope you'll express uh, views about is uh, the uh, possible disciplinary proceedings in Florida and um, Pennsylvania. Um, and then the other is, um, one of Mr. Clayman's arguments is uh, ES was impeached in a variety of ways at the hearing and the, the, in ways that raised questions about her credibility. And um, one of his uh, arguments is the hearing committee report doesn't really come to grips and expressly acknowledge those areas of impeachment and explain why they didn't, uh, you know, why nonetheless the hearing committee was determining on matters in dispute to credit ES rather than uh, Mr. Clayman. Um, and uh, is there a place in the hearing committee report where it kind of acknowledges the various impeachment uh, areas that Mr. Clayman has identified and explains why explicitly there's a decision to credit ES rather than Mr. Clayman on disputed matters? Or you think Mr. Clayman is exaggerating the impeachment or uh, what's your response to, to that kind of line of attack on the hearing committee report? All right, let me, let me respond to those in order. First on the complaints in Florida and Pennsylvania, there, there, there are two things disciplinary council wants to point out. First, they are completely irrelevant to this proceeding. Collateral estoppel does not apply. There was no privity between this jurisdiction and those jurisdictions. And so we, uh, disciplinary council, had no reason to, to pursue that because they are irrelevant. This court has, cons and as do other jurisdictions, take the view that you respond and you review hearings and uh, disciplinary proceedings within this jurisdiction. Second, there is no documentary evidence in the record of a complaint filed by ES in Florida or Pennsylvania. There's no copy of the complaint. Well, no I, you, your opponent argues that's not accurate because there is a document that, uh, which is, a, I think, maybe a 
so a written document, a complaint or something filed by ES in which she says she filed such complaints. So, but, but maybe, we don't know. Maybe, but it, it maybe it depends on the word document. You know, document. Well, Your Honor, with with, uh, with respect, we don't know what she filed. For example, in uh, I understand that is you're using the word docu There's no documentary evidence, which you're you know obviously triggered a pretty. Uh, uh, strong response from your opponent uh, as not being uh, accurate. And it just, it seems to me there people might be disagreeing about the use of the word documentary. There is a document in the record that tends to show that a complaint was filed. Do you agree with that? There is a document in the record that says that the complainant in this proceeding said she filed complaints in other, in other jurisdictions. We have no idea what she filed, whether she filed them. And, and more important, in some jurisdictions, the, in, in, in Florida or Pennsylvania, the complaint must be uh, sworn. Uh, there's no evidence of that. Put, we have not seen, and there is not in the record, any evidence of a complaint. If a letter of dismissal had been sent to a respondent, he would have it. If he had lost it, he would have contacted the jurisdiction and asked them for another copy or asked them to submit a written notification that they no, no longer had a copy of that. Uh, because they didn't keep those records. No, none of that evidence, would, which would have gone to what was filed. For example, if an unsworn or unsigned complaint had been filed in another jurisdiction, the jurisdiction might have simply discarded it because it didn't meet with their requirements. That's not a dismissal on the record if you discard a complaint because it didn't meet your requirements. So we have no idea what was filed in those other jurisdictions. That's the only point disciplinary counsel was attempting to make, and uh, we attempted to make that in our response to the accusations of respondent. On your second point about the um, uh, whether the hearing committee had an obligation to explain why it credited uh, some of the complainant's testimony and not the- Well, to be clear, to be clear, I, I wasn't making a point, I was asking a question and that wasn't quite my question. I wasn't asking what the hearing committee was obliged to do. Uh, I was just asking what the hearing committee and, you know, it was a compound question, but it was really, do you agree that Ms. Uh, that, that, that ES was impeached in a variety of ways of the hearing, A, and B, is there uh, a part of the hearing committee report that addresses that impeachment and explains the credibility determinations that the hearing committee made in light of that impeachment? That, the hearing committee, I'm sorry, Your Honor. The hearing committee did not expressly explain its credibility determinations with respect to each of the issues it had to consider. And nor, as, as you implied in, in, in your rephrasing of the question, were they obligated to do so? It, 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 it would have been um, interesting had they done so, and, but they, what their responsibility faced with conflicting testimony is to determine based on the record, based on what they hear, which testimony they credited. Uh, Mr. Clayman was credited in some respects. Uh, the complainant was credited in other respects. Uh, Mr. Clayman thinks that the uh, complainant was credited in more respects than he was and credited when he would not have credited her. There is substantial evidence in the record to support the hearing committee's decision and the board's decision to adopt after review the hearing committee's report and recommendation. So were they, did they sort of, um, uh, provide a nuanced analysis of each of their credibility determinations? No, they did not. Uh, but again, their job was to make that nuanced determination and that they did. Mr. Link, can I, um, we reached your time, but we did give um, additional time to the other parties who argued. Could you address please the reason for the um, extensive delay here in bringing the the, the ultimate uh, complaint findings of fact and, and proposed recommended suspension here. Se seven years seems to be a long time. As, as we pointed out in, in our brief, there was a period of time where the complainant uh, was, was not available. Uh, we have to remember the complainant had been traumatized by this experience uh, it took a lot for her to file her complaints initially. And then after she did, uh, she, she was not available for interviews and for further communication. 
After about four or five years, uh, she uh, resurfaced. We were able to contact her, and that's when the process began. And as you know, now, Mr. Clayman alleges that this lengthy period of time um, prejudiced him uh, because memories had faded, uh, witnesses were unavailable, um, and in particular, um, he notes a, a couple of examples. Um, um, one that I'd like to hear your response to in particular is the fact that um, Ms. A.S.'s psychologist was no longer available. She was on A.S.'s witness list, but Mr. Clayman's intention was that he had the opportunity to cross-examine her. Uh, and she was not available. I don't believe it was because of passage of time. I believe it was because she had some, see, she had an illness and, and, and was not available because of her illness. Um, you know, she was not available to us and she was not available to Mr. Clayman. So I don't know that he was prejudiced. Remember, as you pointed out, she was on our witness list and we were not able to call her. I will note that one of Mr. Clayman's witnesses, his expert, uh, Professor Ron Rotunda, uh, eminent expert was not available because he had passed away, yet his expert report was admitted into evidence even though he was not subjected to cross-examination, he wasn't available, and even though his expert report opined on the ultimate issue in the case, which an expert report should never do and is never admitted when it opines, that part is never admitted when it opines on the ultimate issue. So in effect, he got the benefit of the doubt with respect to that witness where we thought that should not have been admitted at all. So far from being prejudiced, we think Mr. Clayman uh, did very well. And, and the prejudice of the psychologist, uh, she was not available to us and we were not able to uh, examine her. Did Can I ask another question? Because I, 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 I think, and maybe I'm assuming or presuming too much from um, Mr. Clayman and his counsel's arguments on this delay point, but, should there be some type of time limitation on how long um, uh, disciplinary counsel should wait or take before bringing a claim before it's stale? Um, you know, after, if after seven years or five years or three years, is there some point in time at which the claim is stale and disciplinary counsel should not pursue it? Your Honor, thank you. That's a great question. And I know two things. One, the hearing committee specifically considered this issue. Mr. Clayman filed numerous motions before the hearing committee on this and other issues, and they went back and looked over the testimony. And it's in the hearing committee report, the witnesses testified clearly and specifically, there was no indication that their memory had lapsed. They had different views, but they testified very specifically as to these issues and it's, it's in the report, the hearing I'm committee sure considered, true. and there was no evidence Mr. Of, Mr. of forgetfulness. Mr. Link, uh, I'm not sure it's true there was no evidence of memory loss. At one point, ES did say, it's been a, you know, a lot of time and I forget. So uh, I, I think it might be an exaggeration to say that there was no indication that the passage of time uh, affected memories. But I think the chief, the chief judge's question might have been also not so much about this case, but more a general policy question, which is, Your Honor, uh, should there be a, essentially like a statute of limitations applicable to the bringing of disciplinary actions? And uh, does disciplinary counsel have a kind of a policy view about whether there should or shouldn't be such a such a? Yeah, that, that's exactly my question. Thank you, Judge McLeese, for for re, re teeing that up because, it, I mean, why why was this important to to to? pursue after so much time had elapsed and what is disciplinary counsel's policy with that regard? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, first of all, disciplinary counsel takes each case on its own merits. And so when it considered the totality of circumstances in this case, when the complainant uh, resurfaced and was could be interviewed and, and talked with, disciplinary counsel felt on the merits of this case, whenever we face uh, misconduct, we have a decision to make whether to bring it, we thought on the merits to bring it. Now, whether there should be a statute of limitations or something like that, that's clearly within the court's purview. Uh, uh, disciplinary counsel, one of the things this court has never done is to uh, reverse or dismiss a case 
for uh, delay. And one of the questions this court always answer, asks is, was there prejudice? Was there prejudice? And the hearing committee and the board carefully considered that issue and determined there was no prejudice in this case. Presumably, if there was prejudice, then you would have an argument to say uh, this case is time barred. We don't have that in this case. Whether as a general rule, there should be a statute of limitations, if you will, I am not uh, authorized to comment on that. That's something I will take back to disciplinary counsel if the court would like a response. But certainly on a case by case basis, the issue is, was there prejudice? And here, there, now yes, respondent will argue and we've heard his arguments, but you've heard the responses. He was able to introduce his expert report. We were not able to introduce the psychologist who was on our witness list. The testimony was reviewed by the hearing committee and the board. Uh, Judge McLeese, I take your point. There was an instance when the complainant said she couldn't remember, but again, that hurt us. That didn't hurt the respondent. So um, I, I think uh, there's no prejudice here. And um, in, in this case, we think uh, this was uh, well brought and the board and the hearing committee, their decisions are entitled to uh, deference by this uh, court. On the psychologist question, did either side proffer what they might have hoped to get from her had she uh, testified for either side? Your Honor, as we pointed out in our brief, the respondent never proffered what he hoped to get from her, never proffered uh, what the testimony he hoped to elicit from her. Therefore, for him to, after the fact, say, well, he was uh, uh, prejudiced is uh, under the rules of law is simply in inappropriate and inapplicable. And my question had two halves. Uh, you addressed half of it, but the other half was, uh, did disciplinary counsel proffer anything about what it expected that the uh, psychologist might have said? Your Honor, I, I don't believe that we did, but I'm I'm much sure I'm much sure about what respondent did not do in that matter. All right. Uh, um, unless there are any further questions, we'll turn back to Mr. Kleiman, who reserved a few minutes for a rebuttal. Um, Mr. Kleiman, you're you're on mute, Mr. Kleiman. Thank you, Your Honor. I don't know why it goes it defaults to mute. First of all, let me answer it in reverse order because it's fresh in our mind. Number one, if you go back and look in the transcript, I'm reasonably certain that I set forth why I wanted Dr. Aviera's testimony. In fact, this was an error, a serious error in the board report. I had moved to take her discovery early on, and that was denied. I had moved to also take Ms. Sataki, given the passage of time. That was denied. It was denied without prejudice to be able to renew that request at the hearing, which I did, and that's on the record. And I will submit those pages of the transcript to show you that there was a proffer made why I needed her testimony. As far as uh, Mr. Rotunda is concerned, that was just a preliminary letter to try to head off an investigation. I was trying to reason with disciplinary counsel. I couldn't with Mr. Fox and it started. But Rotunda, who was one of the premier ethics experts, if he had been able to appear at the hearing, could have rebutted things that were said by the so-called expert of Ms. Sataki, particularly with regard to the use of, of Bivens. And although he did con uh, concede that a lawyer gets to make a judgment call on what co possibly could coerce settlement and that it was not improper to file a Bivens case, is that Rotunda was not there to rebut anything. And consequently, that letter you know, was, a, was of little use at the hearing. Number three, the Office of District Counsel does have a policy. It's referenced in our briefs that after a significant, after you know, a lag of time, particularly seven years, that it's considered that the complainant abandons its complaint. Here, they actually hired a private investigator to hunt her down to find her. It wasn't that she resurfaced. She was hunted down because a decision was made by that office to remove me from the practice of law. And that's been apparent throughout, not just this, but with regard to other matters. The other thing I want to point out, and, and I ask your honor to read very carefully the testimony of Tim Shamble. He's an eyewitness of what happened. It's not he said, she said. He actually confirms everything that I have said. It's very important to read that testimony. He was the union rep. He was my partner. He was there every step of the way. 
he met with Ms. Sataki and I, and he can attest and did attest to the informed consent that was given for our actions. Our goal was to achieve a settlement. Our, our goal was to get her back to Los Angeles. It wasn't to make money. Like I said, you know, I'm now 71. I'd be 100 years old before we saw any money out of suing the government for something like this. It, it just doesn't happen with rights of appeal and everything else. I cared about the, the woman, and, and I still empathize. But you don't blame someone just because you didn't succeed, and you don't disparage their religion, and you don't accuse them of accepting bribes. You know, and Miss Allred, who I'm friend with, friends with, by the way, has told me same things happened to her. When some of her clients didn't get what they wanted, they filed bar complaints. You actually have had them in front of, in front of the Office of Disciplinary Counsel. It's a reaction. It's the victim mentality. And last but hardly least is that there never was an allegation of sexual harassment in the specification of charges. There has never been any finding of sexual harassment. The board had to conjure up this concept of an emotional interest. And emotional interest is something which is so vague as your honors have pointed out, you have emotional interest if you represent your wife or your husband, and that happens in, in, in the law. And, well, and I'm not sure I'm following this point, Mr. Klayman. I mean, the, the word, the rule is uh, generally worded. I think personal interest might be the phrase, although I don't have it in front of me. Uh, and uh, so I, I don't think, you know, obviously any lawyer might have a variety of personal interests in a matter uh, and you could be friendly with your client or you could have lots of different interests. Um, but what the rule prohibits is interests that, that would interfere with your mm -hmm. performance as a lawyer. And the, what, the, what the board found or the hearing committee found and the board upheld was in part based on emails that you yourself sent that uh, however described your uh, emotional feelings towards your client were interfering with your representation of her. Um, and and do, you, do you think that uh, unless the uh, feelings were sexual in character, they can't, they're, they're like categorically ineligible to give rise to a conflict of interest or what's, I'm not sure I follow it, the point. It actually caused me to work harder because I really wanted her to succeed. And no, that, that's certainly your position. Okay. In the yeah. And, 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 and Kim Campbell testifies to that, <clears throat> how hard I worked and how he recommended me to others. But when I felt that it was getting too personal, when she was asking me to buy her a new Mercedes because her other one had been repossessed. Then I said, it's time to get another lawyer. And I took her to the best, to Gloria Allred. I recommended that she hire him, that she hire her. I took her to Tim Shea, a lawyer who had a lot of experience with Voice of America on cases. She didn't want to do that. She wanted to continue with me. And then, of course, the decision came out. And, you know, then she went into, you know, a cocoon in effect, didn't want to communicate because she felt that somehow she had been wronged by the court and she blamed me. And the same thing happens to Miss Allred, everybody else sometimes, when clients don't get what they want, they blame the lawyer. And that's not just. But the key here is, Your Honor, is to look at what Shamble testified to. He was an eyewitness to what was going on. He is the best witness that you can have. Mr. Dash, also eyewitness. Uh, also, even my sister, Ashley Clayman, who was there, she shared everything with them. And then last but not least, a point I want to make is that they claim that somehow I revealed confidential information. Well, during the course of the briefing, the paralegal for my prior counsel uncovered a video that was done by Miss Sataki on a Persian station in the Valley in Los Angeles, where she reveals everything publicly. And I asked that that be supplemented to the record that was denied by the board there was no reason to deny that it's well the board said that it was uh uh kind of came too late and that there was uh uh, uh you know the the, they, the board had to review the determinations uh of the hearing committee on the record in front of it uh and you know maybe there are exceptions for sort of hmm. new covered evidence and the like but the board obviously was not persuaded those were met well, that's another example of dishonesty on the part of Ms. sataki and it's another example of doing what is right in the interest of justice. Your Honor sits on an appellate court. You know you can even supplement the record on appeal. So that's not, not, early. Uh, that, not before the, the, the decision maker that we're reviewing. Can I ask you, I know you said last but not least. This, this, this is a smoking gun. This is a smoking gun, Your Honor. And okay. it eliminates any, any question about whether she considered 
uh, what uh, she had agreed and in fact distributed herself to be confidential information. And in fact, Your Honor, let me point out one other thing. There's also testimony to her, by her. And <clears throat> on the record, it's our finding of fact 104, I explained to you my problem with Voice of America, meaning me, Larry Clayman. So I don't know why this conversation was so intimate to you, because it was definitely not intimate to me. Everybody knew. In that case, I had an intimate conversation with everyone. That was before she even hired me. So Mr. I, Clayman, I want to I want to wrap back around to a topic that uh, was kind of deferred to your rebuttal, which is the section. Uh, <laughs> 14G affidavit, and I was asking whether your position is, uh, I, I know you contest the temporary suspension and continue to contest it, but leaving that aside, I understood from your brief that you were arguing that as a matter of interpreting the rules, you are not required because it's only a temporary suspension, you're not required to file a section 14G affidavit. And I was trying to clarify whether, first I was trying to clarify whether that is the position that you're taking about how to interpret the rules. That's part of it. Yes, Your Honor, it is. Can I ask you, how do you square but, that? But the also part. Hold on, Mr. Clayman, let me just yeah. ask you about that piece of it. How do you uh, uh, square that position with uh, our Rule 11, Section 9G4, which says, which is about temporary suspensions, and says suspension under this subsection shall take effect as provided in subsection 14F, and an attorney suspended under this subsection shall comply with the requirements of Section 14 of this rule because I interpreted that to mean a permanent suspension, number one. The suspension was indefinite, the temporary suspension, well, there the, was a finite subsection, period. To be clear, the, the rule that I'm reading, subsection G of, of section nine of rule 11, they're confusingly numbered. The heading of it is suspension pending final action by the court. I didn't read it that way, Your Honor. I, you know, again, and, and I didn't, during this time period, practice at all in the District of Columbia. I have not practiced. And I might add this, okay, and, you know, th this Kleinsmith matter, Your Honor is aware of what happened in that regard, I'm sure. He didn't follow any rule, didn't file any affidavits, didn't even inform uh, the Office of Disciplinary Counsel and the Bar Disciplinary Apparatus that he had pled guilty to a felony, a felony of dishonesty, as a matter of fact. By the way, I've never been found to be dishonest in this case or any other case, by the way. And yet, he's led off with even less than a slap on the wrist, he was let off with time served, even though there was no evidence that anyone had talked to his parole officer, no evidence that in fact he had he complied with the terms of his plea agreement. He was let off. And, and, and I know this sounds uh, harsh, Your Honor, but the fact is, is that Office of Disciplinary Counsel and the board have in fact been weaponized. Uh, this is the, the nature of unfortunately our town, the District of Columbia, I still consider it my town, even though I don't live there anymore. I spent almost 40 years there. I still come back, is that it's become a place where the politics of personal destruction takes precedence over the facts and the law. And in the course of the last several years, <clears throat> ODC is considering complaints against Attorney General Bill Barr, who's actually just testified favorably for the left uh, in Wait, the man. last several days. If I may just Add this. I don't understand the point, but we, we okay. want to try right. to focus on um, hearing your arguments with respect to your case. And I think we've been I understand. Uh, uh, generous with our time. But I also, one last point, and I appreciate yes. that, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I should not be penalized for conducting a vigorous defense of myself, nor Miss Isaac's intervention, is that the fact that somehow if you defend yourself and don't throw yourself on the mercy of the DC bar disciplinary apparatus, you, it creates what they consider to be a condition where you should be disciplined and get more discipline. Here I am guilty of trying to do everything I could to try to help ES, doing everything I could to help her. In fact, it's interesting that she's referred to as ES, but yet my name is smeared all over the block by Office of Disciplinary Counsel and by the hearing committee. Uh, and, and that gets to what Miss Isaac said too. Men and women should be treated equally. And the Mr. reason- Smith, I, I take your point, um, I, if I understand the point you're making, uh, one of the comments, the arguments of disciplinary counsel is perhaps that there is a lack of remorse 
on your part here, uh, which which might warrant the imposition of the fit, fitness requirement in addition to the suspension. And I take your point that uh, often if you strongly disagree with the findings um, or have a different view of the, what the factual findings should have been, that that can be, um, in your view, wrongfully held against you when you were trying to defend yourself. Is that? Yes, and I did everything I could to help Yes, I did everything I could. So much so, Your Honor, I don't know if it's in the pleadings or not, it's in the testimony, is that the day that Judge Catelli ruled against her, I was so upset, I almost killed myself on the 405 highway in LA. Uh, I had a concussion, I was severely hurt. It, it upset me so much that justice had not been done. And not to get too religious there, but I, you know, I am a Jewish Christian. And a few days later, I had a concussion. And, and I believe that Christ came to me and said, Larry, clear your head out. You know, you're working for me now. But I was down and out. It was a tough period of my life. I, I identified with her. I wanted to help her. I cared for her. And you should not be penalized for that. All right. Well, thank you. Um, we appreciate the um, party and counsel's arguments and briefs in this case. Um, and at this point, we'll take the matter under advisement. And you are free to exit our uh, virtual courtroom. We're going to take a short recess so that the panel can be reconstituted for our remaining cases today. Thank you all. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you for courtesy. Thank you, Your Honor. This court takes a short recess.
Uh, Council, can I have your attention, please? We're going to start court. So if you can turn your, your cameras on, if you're arguing. All right, thank you. Okay, we'll be starting shortly, thank you. This honorable court is back in session. Please come to order. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the continuation of our virtual uh, regular calendar sitting this afternoon. We have two more cases to hear, um, actually this morning, sorry. Uh, and the next one is number 18 CF 870 and 19 CF 675, Derek Antoine DeCure versus United States. Whenever you're ready, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, may it please the court, Jennifer Williams on behalf of appellant Derek DeClear. I would like to discuss three issues today, the obstruction statutory claim, the lay witness opinion testimony claim, and the voir dire issue. Um, but I'm happy to address any questions the court may have about the remaining issues as well. I would like to reserve two minutes of my time for rebuttal. As the canon of a justum generis dictates, the catch-all provision of the obstruction of justice statute extends only to conduct of a kind with the preceding provisions, namely obstructive acts that seek to interfere with judicial actors, i.e. witnesses, jurors, etc. This construction gives effect to the explicit will of the council and avoids rendering the tampering with physical evidence subsection of the same statutory scheme superfluous or insignificant. Because the judicial task is to discern and give effect to the legislature's intent, and the council did not intend for acts of simple evidence tampering to be punishable under the far more punitive obstruction of justice statute, this court must reverse Mr. DeQueer's conviction for removing guns from his home. Can you say again what you think the, the connecting thread is for the similar provisions that you are arguing the catch-all should be construed in light of? Yes. So um, the, the thread that we find is that all of the enumerated provisions are dealing with obstructive acts that target a judicial actor. We have sort of defined that as a person who is engaged or intending to be engaged or could become engaged in the judicial process and is being obstructed from doing so by the defendant. That would be a witness, a prospective and, witness. And how does that fit with, for example, uh, A to B, uh, causing a person to withhold a document? So A to B is um, the that that uh, clause actually criminalizes threatening or corrupting witnesses or officers and then sort of gives a list of the various things you can convince a witness to do to compromise their participation in an official proceeding. Well, Document you witness, just to make clear, you're, you're saying a witness. It, it, does the uh, provision require that the person be a witness? Um, no, no, it doesn't require that the person be no, a witness. Person I, I believe it says, I believe the language um, is knowingly uses intimidating or, or physical force, threatens or corruptly persuades another person, or by threatening letter or communication endeavors to influence, intimidate, or impede a witness or officer in any official proceeding with intent to, and then um, it gives several examples of different ways that you can impede a person who is involved in the criminal justice process from doing what they are intended to do. Well, why, do you, why, why do you say involved in the process? I want to make sure. So yes. I'm a person, I have a, and I have a, uh, an object and uh, somebody comes to me and says, don't give that object to the police. Does so, that violate, I, I just wanna, does that violate a, uh, to, uh, a to B as you understand, assuming there's a corrupt purpose? So um, A to B is sort of dealing with preventing, they, they mentioned specifically an official proceeding, um, which would, 
mean a person who is being called to bring an object to an official proceeding, such as in a subpoena ducis tecum? Well, no, um, to, to be clear, I, I mean, it, uh, assume that there is an ongoing proceeding. Okay. So, uh, if, and I don't, I, I, but I don't know about it. I'm just a person who has a document. And the defendant comes to me and says, person with a document, um, there's a, you, you know, you didn't know about it till right now, but there's a proceeding going on. There's a grand jury investigation or you know, a, a, an official proceeding. There's a trial coming. And I want you to withhold this document. Yes. Um, is that, that's covered by the statute. So yes, but um, again, the obstructive act there is that you are influencing a would-be witness. So that person has the ability to become a witness because they are in possession of a document that is relevant to an official proceeding or, or, or not even a witness, somebody who would bring that document to the police and assist with the ongoing investigation, furthering justice. The focus of this obstructive act is not the object itself, it is the person who is being prevented or encouraged to withhold that document. I understand if this that. One's... Can I, um, of course. It, it seems to run a little bit against, uh, if I'm remembering a case of ours, right, a Smith case of ours, which says that if you go to somebody who doesn't know anything about a case and therefore wouldn't be a witness until you contact them and you say, hey, will you lie for me in an official proceeding? That, that violates the obstruction statute. Are you familiar with that case? Uh, so I'm sorry, I don't think the Smith case was a part of the the um, the pleadings, but um, I assume for most it's true. Uh, well, first of all, do you think well, is your position that if I am a defendant and I know there and there's a criminal trial coming, and I go to somebody who doesn't know anything about the case, and it therefore wouldn't be a witness but for my intervention? Yes. And I say to that person, do me a favor. Uh, come in and give me a false alibi. Do you think that violates the obstruction statute or you think it doesn't? So it does. And it, it actually isn't at odds with our interpretation of what the obstruction statute is intending to cover. Um, because you are still, this person may not be a witness yet. They may not be subpoenaed. They may not even know about the case, but they have information that could contribute to the investigation, making them a person who is able to assist in the furthering of justice. And you and are obstructing person, that assistance. Hypothetical... Uh, at the beginning, if I am a person who holds a document or an object that is relevant to an official proceeding, aren't I, I mean, someone could subpoena me for it. Aren't I a potential witness? And if the defendant comes to me and says, don't do that, withhold it, uh, I'm not quite sure why it doesn't fit in both with the wording of this provision, but also uh, it seems um, uh, uh, I mean, so, you know, uh, and is your point that you have to have that status before the defendant's intervention? That's the part where I'm getting confused because- right. No, that is not our point. Our point is um, it's not sort of turning on whether or not this person is aware of and um, currently in the process of becoming involved in this official proceeding. It's turning on the fact that this is all dealing with obstructing individuals who could have, have the potential to become involved in and assist with a proceeding, either because they have a document or they have information, they could go to the police. Um, that would be sort of that, that category of would-be witnesses that we're talking about as we also capture in um, judicial actors. But I think the important point about this is the distinction between um, A to B and uh, sort of the kind of conduct that's at issue in this case um, is that the, this is not focused on protecting the integrity or the availability of physical evidence, it is only a sort of connected to physical evidence by virtue of that evidence's association with an individual. So it is still very focused on obstructing an individual who has the ability to bring some sort of evidence to a case. So all of this sort of fits but, into- but I you, So once, Mr., uh, once your client had the contacts that he had with the people who uh, came into possession of the gun and the like. Um, they, they seem like they fit that bill. Um, so they don't. Um, sorry. Uh, well, just to be clear, if, if if I is your point that if I say to someone who doesn't presently have, so someone has a gun already, and I say, you know, there's a, a official proceeding that that'd be relevant to. I want you to withhold it. You'd say that's definitely under. That, you don't need the catch-all for that. That's under uh, uh, A to B, uh, right? So. Um, uh, so just, just to clarify the, the point I was trying to make, a, a person who is being asked to move guns that they don't possess does, isn't withholding something. Oh, I understand. Say someone already has it. Someone already has it. Okay. And it, that, that seems to be simple with, that's for sure withholding. If I understand, if, if on the other hand, um, 
if I if I'm the defendant, instead of telling you withhold the gun that you already have because it would be evidence against me in official proceeding, and I don't want that to be known, that was a violation not of the catch-all necessarily alone, but of the these provisions. If I understand your position, now if I said to you go you know steal the gun from uh, you know uh, Judge Ali Khan, you would say that's not withholding because you don't already have it. You can't withhold what you don't have. That would be taking it. Although what is a little puzzling is as soon as you get it from Judge Ali Khan, if you then hide it, it seems to me that the second half of what you're doing at my request would be withholding because um, so, you have it. And so why isn't at least the second half of what the the uh, folks who you know uh, took the guns and moved them and like, why isn't that actually a violation of this provision? Why didn't they get, you know, my direction is A, go get the gun, B, then, you know, move it some other place so it isn't uh, available in the official proceeding. I'm, I'm a little unsure why it doesn't actually violate the statute itself. So I think the answer to that kind of comes in the word withhold. Withhold is suggestive of a person who's expressing an intent to go to the police. This is not a person who um, is, uh, com this, is a, this is a person who is expressing an intent to go to the police and you are obstructing or preventing or interfering with or discouraging that intent to participate by telling them not just to remove weapons, but to withhold them from the police. So I think that the, 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 the sort of important focus here is that this is people who would otherwise be wanting to assist in the furthering of the judicial process and are being prevented. Sure I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I, again, I'm, I'm unsure about this. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure I'm getting your drift. So imagine okay. that you and I are co-defendants yes. and in a shooting and you have the gun that was used in the shooting. And you probably wouldn't be very enthusiastic about giving it to the police, um, but I don't know. And I say to you, you know, uh, don't give the gun to the police, go destroy it. Are you saying that's not a violation of this provision because you hadn't previously indicated an intent to give it to the police and I was just trying to be preventative? Uh, so I, I think that um, you, there needs to be sort of a second layer there of obstructive conduct where you are trying to discourage them from take, from giving it to the police. There is sort of a assumption within this that these are people who are otherwise going to be lawful actors within the criminal justice process that would be assisting and you are preventing that assistance. So just telling somebody to go move some guns is not akin to um, th there's a difference between telling someone to move those guns and then having that friend be like, actually, I feel uncomfortable about this. You know, I want to go to the police with these guns. And then you tell them, actually, if you go to the police, I'm going to harm you or I'm going to give you money if you don't go to the police. That would be that second layer would be the obstructive act that falls under this statutory provision. But Otherwise, really getting this notion that they have to want to help the police all the time, we have to kind of subpoena people that don't want to testify. And so if you were to try to prevent that person from testifying or from bringing whatever they have, it seems like that would fit under these provisions. So I I'm, uh, perhaps want is um, an, an, an artful or inexact uh, frame. What I mean is that this is a person who either by by force or by subpoena or by other means would have been someone who is contributing to the furthering of justice and is being prevented or discouraged from doing so. So a person is subpoenaed, they don't want to come to court, but you are convincing them to duck that subpoena or to ignore it um, by corrupt persuasion or by threat. That would be an act of obstruction. If a person is completely divorced from a case, has absolutely no ability to contribute to it, um, that person is not a judicial actor within the meaning of the statute or within our sort of def definition of the thread that runs through all of the um, preceding provisions to the catch-all provision. So Mr. DeQueer's friends were not judicial actors. They knew nothing about this case, had no connection to it. They weren't told, please withhold these guns from the police. They were told, please move these guns. Perhaps in telling them where the guns were, he created a witness, but he then did not prevent that witness from testifying against him or from contributing to the case at all. Why did he not? You mean, you think there have to be two separate conversations or if, uh, or do you think it has to be explicit? Um, so it, would you think your client would have violated these provisions and then maybe the catch-all, or if not exactly these, maybe the catch-all, if your client had said, I have two requests of you. A, you know, they're these guns and I'm worried about them as evidence against me in connection with an official proceeding. I would like you to move them. And by the way, B, don't tell, you know, don't, when you move them, hide them. Don't take them to police and don't tell the police about where you moved them. 
you if that was explicit, the second half of the, the second, you know, the, the, those latter things, would you say that violated these provisions and the catch all or would you say not? Does it have to be two separate conversations? Or? So I would say that the the act that is the focus of this of this um, kind of uh, of this entire statutory scheme is that act of telling a person not to assist with the police. And so you can't just infer that into a conversation with friends who are completely divorced from the case and asking them to move guns. I think it's also actually helpful in this case to- Sorry, let me jump in there. What if there had been this initial conversation and then they went and got the guns and then there was a second conversation later in the week. Hey, did you hide those guns from the police? Thanks, I really appreciate that. Does that suddenly change the analysis? Um, telling them that you appreciated the fact that they hid the guns from the police. Confirming that your intent was for them to withhold this from the investigation. Um, so I think that, um, I, I don't think that that changes the analysis of whether or not the original conversation was an attempt to obstruct a witness. I also think that this is kind of, um, in terms of I, I understand the, the questions in the hypothetical. I just want to also focus on the fact that um, in this particular case, the focus of this obstructive conduct was absolutely the guns. You can see that from the indictment and the bill of particulars. Um, there was no suggestion that the concern here was he was obstructing witnesses who would have been um, bringing these, who, who that the concern was the act of having a conversation with witnesses and asking them to hold them from the police. That was not the focus of the indictment. I believe the indictment language is um, that the basis for the charge is his efforts after he was arrested to have the firearms moved so that the government would not locate them and use them as evidence against your client in the instant case. So to the extent that they're even mentioning the fact that there was a conversation here with anyone, it's in the passive voice. It's not a focus on the act of sort of obstructing these people from lawfully bringing guns to the police as a part of, you know, as their capacity as witnesses. So this is a case- Headed. I mean, I had taken you to tee up a statutory interpretation slash sufficiency argument. Uh, your comment now seems to be uh, kind of hinting at a possible alternative argument that would be in the nature of, well, even if uh, 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 there, were, even if this case might qualify as a matter of statutory interpretation and uh, um, uh, evidence because of the fact that there were conversations to get someone to hide the guns rather than just the defendant hiding the guns uh, himself, uh, the case wasn't uh, uh, indicted or instructed to the jury that way. That seems like a separate set of topics that weren't really teed up uh, for us to decide. Or, um, so I, we did mention that the uh, this quote was included in our briefs. It is sort of a part of our argument in general, but I think the the point that I'm trying to make here is that every single um, provision that is that is enumerated, including, and we can all agree that this is the closest, A to B, is dealing with or concerned with an obstructive act against an individual. If this was intended just to govern um, sort of the obstruction of a piece of evidence, its physical integrity or its availability, then- Why do you say against? Can I ask you about against? I mean, uh, again, if- Sure. Uh, uh, Back to my the, the hypothetical where you and I were co-defendants, and you know we're friends, and I say to you, I'm corruptly persuading you. I'm not doing anything against you in the natural sense of that term. And I say, I know you have the murder weapon. Don't give it to the police. Um, I, I'm not doing anything against you. I am corruptly persuading you to withhold an object from an official proceeding. Or do you agree that that would be covered by this provision, or do you think there would be something missing in that hypothetical? Well, that would be a situation where a person, so to say, don't bring it to the police, there's sort of um, buried in that is a foundational expectation that that is a concern. Um, you are asking them not to bring it to the police because otherwise you think that they might. That is dealing with a situation where you're having withholding. There's no suggestion. Here. I understand that. I, I, I understand that idea, but I was, I, you were suggesting that, the. Uh, uh, I thought you were suggesting the possibility that the concern is to protect witnesses from things they might not want. So you have to be against the witness. If it isn't adverse to the witness, then it's not really obstruction. And I was unsure if that's what you're trying to get at. And it, and mm -hmm. it, it seemed to be counterintuitive if that's your point. And I gather it's not your point. It's not my point. Apologies if I'm being inexact in my phrasing. 
obviously bribery, corrupt persuasion, that all falls under this statute. Uh, that is actually the explicit purpose of passing the catch-all provision was to capture bribery. So you can you can be you can be, use a carrot or a stick and fall under the statute. Um, but the point is that what you are trying to do is you're trying to prevent a person from doing something that would be lawfully engaging or contributing to the furtherance of justice. They're sort of buried beneath all of this. And you can look at the language, intimidating, preventing, um, impeding, all of that suggests prevention of a person from taking an act. I mean, also just in the nature of obstruction, you're preventing someone from moving forward with something. So there has to be some intent that a person is going to be trying to lawfully engage in the process and you are preventing that engagement. And that's just not the case that we have here. That's why this falls outside of um, the statutory scheme for this and falls under tampering with physical evidence. Yes, it's being done via an agent, but that's a perfectly reasonable way of committing tampering with physical evidence. Um, if, if Judge McLeese doesn't have further questions, I'd actually like to turn you to an issue that you did not preview in your intro, but about the Anthony Ryan's testimony. Okay. Um, so what, in your view, was the government required to do to make him, to, to ensure themselves that he was unavailable such that they could use his prior testimony? So I think that um, Brooks has this sort of discussion about um, comparing what they would have done when they didn't have the testimony with what they did in this case. And I think we can fortunately do that pretty effectively because there's a record of what was done in 2018 when they really needed him, what they did in 2019. So in 2018, I'd, I'd like to focus on two things. First, the timing of when they started and then um, what they actually did. So 2018, you have them starting um, at least a month before trial begins. You have them activating the uh, council, the council, the marshal in South Carolina um, on the, in, in January. The trial in 2018 took place at the very end of February. Um, and you have them searching for a number of days and eventually getting a tip from a confidential informant that led to his recovery, but the government admitted he was not easy to find. Flash forward to 2019, you have them starting to look for him on the day the trial is originally scheduled to begin. You have them making phone calls in the district for four days, even though they're aware that he had relocated to South Carolina, making absolutely no effort in South Carolina, not contacting or activating the marshals in any way. And then you have them moving to have him found unavailable on the 5th. Now, the reason that that's significant, obviously they did things after that, but the reason that's significant is because I think it goes to the um, to the analysis of whether or not their vigilance had relaxed um, in terms of whether these were actually good faith, due diligent efforts. Um, but then we can look at what they did after the fifth. For 13 days, they did social media um, and database searches, and they made a couple of out of jurisdiction calls. It was only on the 18th when the court said that they were going to have to provide affidavits from everyone who had been involved in the search that they actually did went to his mother's house for the first time and that they contacted the marshals in South Carolina and asked them to start looking. And then the marshals looked for one day on the day before the unavailability hearing, probably only for a certain number of hours during that one day. And then they decided to call it quits. All of this sort of tells us that their efforts in 2018 were much more vigorous than their efforts in 2019, it seems that they were under the impression that they would be able to get his testimony in and that frankly, they could mail it in a little bit. Um, so that's the, um, our- can, can I ask you an aspect of that? Uh, 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 I mean, I take your point, they started late. I think that's hard to dispute that, you know, they, they definitely didn't get started when they ought to have. Um, but the trial court, in part seem to, to, to rely on the following line of thinking, and I'm interested in what you think of this line of thinking. Um, assume that uh, in a situation like this, the party who's trying to get an unavailability determination really did a terrible job uh, in looking and should have started earlier and didn't do a bunch of things that should have been done. But at the end of the day, in fact, you know, starting earlier wouldn't have made a difference because, you know, the witness, you know, in, in the easiest case, the witness is absolutely unavailable. Um, and so, although you could, you couldn't say the efforts were good or exhaustive, you could say kind of in the alternative, well, better efforts wouldn't have made a difference. The trial court seemed in part to think that and think, well, maybe they should have started earlier. There's more they could have done, but I just don't think if they'd started earlier, they would have found uh, this person in time. 
Um, do you think that's a legitimate form of reasoning? And uh, if, if you think it's a legitimate form of reasoning, um, do you think the record would support the trial court? Do you think the trial court rested in part on that thought? And do you think the record supports that kind of a thought? So first, I don't think it's a legitimate form of reasoning, and I don't think that the record supports it. So um, first to the first matter, uh, the Brooks Court makes clear that the um, in, in terms of assessing whether or not the efforts were sufficient, whether they were adequate good faith efforts, the court is supposed to look um, at, take that in context. It's a very fact specific analysis. And when you have a very um, difficult witness, their burden on you goes up. And so you're supposed to consider whether they took steps as were required before and after. Um, you're supposed to look at what they did in general and whether or not it was reasonable and demonstrated in an actual good faith desire to find this person. And that would so include- concrete about that. Um, so here's the hypothetical, just to see if you, uh, how far you take that. Sure. So, you know, imagine that there was a very important witness at a first trial and then there's a retrial. And, you know, the, the, in advance of the trial, the a party says, you know, we want to use the testimony at the second trial. The witness is unavailable, uh, and you go to a hearing on the day, you know, the day before trial. And the judge says to the party who's seeking an unavailable determination, "Well, what have you done to try to find the witness?" And the, that party says, "I haven't done anything. I just, you know, or, you know, I I, uh, I, I uh, called the person's phone number and I got no answer and left a message." And the trial judge says, well, that's, you know, obviously not even remotely adequate. Um, and then, you know, right as that's going on, someone comes in and says, oh, you know, by the way, the witness is dead. Uh, you know, is it really matter uh, or the witness, uh, you know, is now, you know, in prison in a country that has no extradition treaty in the United States and will never be coming, you know, won't be coming back for 10 years. Would you really say no unavailability because the efforts were obviously inadequate or if the witness really is unavailable, even though the, the party who was trying to demonstrate unavailability did a terrible job of trying to secure the witness, uh, you would say, sorry, the witness is going to be deemed available because of the inadequacy of the efforts of the party who was seeking a declaration of unavailability. So I think that there's a difference between the dead witness and the witness who is in a uh, country that won't extradite. If, it, if there is a showing that if they had started earlier, um, and made efforts sooner, they might have been able to secure the witness, then that is relevant to the good faith effort analysis. So I get that for sure, but imagine that it turns out in my, just to clear how far you think it's an invalid form of reasoning uh, yes. outright. Imagine that the person, you know, had, as it turns out, the person, uh, you know, six months, you know, two weeks after the original retrial and for anybody who was getting, you know, original trial where anybody was focused on the retrial, the person, you know, had gone to a foreign country and, was not retrievable. Um, so there was no way that any, you know, that, that better efforts would have changed the outcome. Would you agree then that the trial court could say, well, I think this witness, you know, this, the, the party seeking an unavailability determination did a terrible job, but it, it wouldn't have made any difference because even the best job would not have secured the presence of the witness. I, oh. It seems like it might be a legitimate form of reasoning if it were firmly enough established in the record. I think, I think yes, I, I, I think in, in the case that it would, literally be an impossibility if they started earlier to ever have ever get this witness here. Um, I accept the reasoning um, as the court puts forth. But I think that this record is very, very different from that. You have um, starting before, like let's start before trial, what they could have done pre-trial. Obviously we raised the fact that they didn't subpoena him while he was incarcerated. They didn't get any additional contact information for him. They didn't make any efforts to track his release date. No efforts were done, even though the government was fully aware that this man only shows up in court when he's un already in prison. That is something that they said to the judge in the unavailability hearing. So they knew that this was going to be someone who they needed to keep track of and they needed to know when he was going to be released. On top of that, let's say they started six months earlier. He at that point had a, an established address. He was living with his fiance. She had a job at a Taco Bell. They knew her address. They could have gone there. They could have found him if they had started six months earlier. And he would have been at that point brought in on the Prince George County um, warrant. I believe it was Prince George County warrant. And then they could have brought him in via day writ to the trial. Um, and okay. That's one, one very detailed question about that. So uh, uh, in that hypothetical world, um, I guess the question of how long he would have been incarcerated in connection with the warrants that were outstanding, or maybe at that point warrant that was outstanding, I guess seems a little, little unclear, which doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily fatal to your argument at all. I'm just trying to make sure I understand the record. Is it clear how long he would have been incarcerated on 
that, that warrant, I, ultimately there were multiple warrants, I thought maybe two warrants ultimately. There were actually multiple warrants. There was a warrant for an arrest, I think in, in South Carolina. And then there was also a warrant um, from Prince George County where he had fled. He'd never checked in after his after he was released on probation. So I actually don't have the answer to that question, how long he would be incarcerated. I think we can assume that he was going to be incarcerated for at least a couple months, given that he um, had fled his probation and that he had an outstanding warrant in the, in the South Carolina just district. So they could have done a day writ from South Carolina as well. Um, uh, but I, I don't have the exact answer to that question, Judge McLeese. Um, now, going to what they could have done uh, at the actual once, uh, first of all, they could have started all of this a few months early. I think that's, uh, it's unreasonable. It's completely unreasonable to start on the day of trial when you know you're dealing with a witness who is um, notoriously uh, evasive, has been evasive at everything, single trial, but they started on the day of trial. After that, there were a number of things they could have done that they didn't do. Brooks talks about this concept of half measures, and I think we see a lot of those in this case. They um, say that they want to talk to his mother, what they actually did was they went to her house, talked to the girlfriend of her, his brother, who'd never met him, and then called it a day. They didn't follow up with anyone in his immediate family who he might have been in touch with, who might have had good contact information for him. They didn't talk to anyone who lived in South Carolina. He had a brother who lived in Florence. He had a grandmother who lived in Charlotte. They didn't follow up on either of those leads, even though those people were presumably closer to him physically and would have been able to find him. They didn't start looking in South Carolina where he told them in 2018 he had relocated until the 22nd, the day before the um, unavailability hearing. This is two weeks into trial. And I'd like to just also point out that a lot of, I, I think all of the cases that are looking at um, unavailability, uh, unless you're having sort of a mid-trial flight, um, are dealing with what you did before trial. And the fact that they did nothing before trial is very important in this case. Um, so Ms. Williams, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to these arguments. I guess, how do we then square that though with the abuse of discretion standard of review? Um, so I think that what the, the standard is, and let me just get this here. Um, so the court conducts a, a context and fact specific uh, analysis in the case. And um, the, a question on appeal, I'm sorry, I uh, was a little less prepared to argue this particular argument, but um, the question on appeal is whether the there was sufficient evidence to support the trial judge, judge's ruling that the government met its burden to show the witness was unavailable. So really this court is looking at the evidence in this case and is addressing that question of whether or not the evidence supported the ruling of the court. And I think that here it did not. Not only were there a lot of measures that were not pursued, a lot of leads that could have been fruitful, stones that were not unturned, but you also have the failure to act previously, which weighs heavily against the government's good faith showing. So um, I think on this record, it's not a problem. Uh, the abuse of discretion standard is um, easily met with this court's review of the record in this case. Um, if you wanna, um, I may, if my colleagues don't have other questions, I know you had a, a couple of other issues you wanted to touch on while in your limited time. Uh, yes. So um, next I wanted to discuss the, um, the lay opinion testimony, lay witness opinion testimony. Um, so the trial court aired when it precluded uh, the lay opinion testimony of Detective Branson, which would have critically corroborated Mr. DeQueer's assertion that there is a common misconception in the district that self-defense does not exist. Detective Branson would have said, based on his years of experience as a homicide detective, talking to witnesses and defendants, that they often tell him there is no self-defense in DC. As the government concedes, the trial court was incorrect when it ruled that this testimony could only be properly introduced as expert testimony, or they don't concede it, they haven't argued it uh, the contrary on appeal. Um, because this was the only evidence that would have supported Mr. DeQueer's seemingly implausible assertion that he did not know self-defense existed in DC when he took steps to cover up the shooting, this error was harmful and this court should reverse. What about the court's essentially alternative holding that this wouldn't be sort of probative and that it would be prejudicial and have a tendency to mislead? Doesn't that sort of excuse any potential error on this expert versus lay question? 
No, it doesn't. So first of all, we don't actually have a 403 ruling. There was no finding that this was more su substantially more prejudicial than probative. There is sort of a commentary that this is more prejudicial than probative. Um, but uh, that assertion is very much rooted in this misunderstanding about the admissibility of this kind of law. It essentially amounts to a statement that opinion testimony improperly admitted is inherently prejudicial and is not reliable. Um, so it has no probative value because jurors would not be able to sort of assess conflicting lay witness opinions and come to a conclusion um, because they have no foundation for that. If the court had understood that this was properly admitted under 701, it would have understood that this is just within the regular function of the jury. This is- I to, how this, I, I want to try to understand the logical theory underpinning the relevance of this evidence and uh, uh, apologies for yet another hypothetical, but um, do you think Mr. DeClear could have just called a, a, somebody he didn't even know, just a person and who, who he had found at least at one point had been under the misapprehension that there is no right of self-defense in the district? Could he have just called a, a person, not a lay opinion person, but just a person to corroborate his testimony on the theory that, um, you know, he wants the jury to believe him when he says, the reason I did what looks like conscious of guilt activity is because I wrongly thought I was guilty because I wasn't aware of self-defense. Now that I know the law, I know I'm innocent. That's his theory. He wants to try to get the jury to believe him when he says that. And uh, your point is, well, the jury might be skeptical of that because it might well think, oh, everybody knows that there's a law of self-defense. So you want to try to get the jury to be open to the idea that other people might have made that mistake. He should believe, you know, the jury should believe uh, your client because other people make that mistake. Could he, could he prove that by just calling in another person who made that mistake and say, there's corroborative evidence. Uh, I want you to believe that I had a false belief and I'm going to try to corroborate my evidence that I did by taking a randomly selected other person and there's another person who believes it. Is there, is that logically relevant in your view? So um, I think perhaps, I, I think that the the relevance of that would be a lot more attenuated. I think the, the importance of uh, Detective Branson's testimony and why it was relevant to Mr. DeQueer's, uh, to corroborating Mr. DeQueer's testimony was that he was going to talk about a wide scale misconception. The well, fact you say wide scale, wide scale is definitely not his term. He said oftentimes in the, he said oftentimes, and then he also said, you know, in the rest of his, the transcript, he's like, well, a few people, you know, so his testimony was a little bit of, uh, uh, certainly, in, unless I'm missing a part of it. So and I think, I, let me just say one thing. Uh, uh, I don't think we have, though my colleagues could correct me if I'm wrong, or you could, there was apparently a sealed transcript where there was discussion ex parte of this issue. And the parties cite to it, but I'm not sure we have it. At least I wasn't able to find it. So maybe we do. I'll, we'll let you know if we need it. But oh, we definitely have the transcript of Detective Branson's prior testimony. And what I saw in there was one use of the word oftentimes, and then some other, well, you know, uh, some people, and then it was down to like, well, you know, a couple people. So it was a little bit of a mixed bag, but I have widespread seems to me to run beyond what I saw, at least in the transcript of Detective Branson's testimony. Okay, so um, I'm sorry that you don't have the sealed transcript. I had assumed that it was a part of the record. We may, I may not have been able to find it, so I, just to be clear. Okay. Yeah. Um, so to respond to that, the defense counsel's proffer was that, so first of all, what he testified to in the transcript that we have, it was different circumstances. What defense counsel proffered they were going to be able to get him to say, or they were going to ask him about, was to get him to talk about how day in, day out, this is something that he deals with. This is a phenomenon in the district. That was going so to be- Is it, uh, you're implying something, I just wanna make sure I'm understanding that implication correctly. Are you suggesting that the that transcript will make clear that there were conversations between defense counsel and Detective Branson about what he would testify to that ran beyond what was reflected in the transcript that was proffered? No. Um, what I'm saying is that I think the questioning would have been different and pointed in a direction that um, would have would have a, would have gotten what defense counsel proffered they were going to get. I think well, that if, if all we know about that is what was said in the transcript, I guess my point is that I'm not sure. I mean, the question might have been that, but the transcript doesn't tell you what the answers would have been. Um, I, I think that I, I think part of the reason potentially that defense counsel had that position was, and, and this is sort of in, in implied in the transcript, is that this isn't 
that this is true. This is a common misconception in DC and defense counsel, that's why defense counsel believed that there wasn't going to be uh, another witness who could be called to impeach it because this is something that people see a lot. And so defense counsel believed that they would be able to question him about that experience and establish a foundation for that lay witness opinion testimony that showed that this is a common misconception. Now, um, the language that the transcript that we used here does talk about oftentimes, it does talk about the fact that he has to have this conversation with people where he has to explain that this is their God-given right, that people don't seem to know this. Even that alone, even if he's not saying this is the most widespread misconception in the world, that alone is helpful and corroborative and um, suggestive of uh, you know, the credibility and legitimacy of what Mr. DeQuere is saying. But on top of that, I think very sort of uh, implicit and at points explicit within the transcript, the sealed transcripts and what defense counsel says later in the open court is that this is something that is common and they were going to be able to get Detective Branson to say that based on their questioning, which was different from the questioning in the um, transcript that we proffered. All we proffered that transcript for was to establish that he knows about this and we can get him to talk about it. And the basis for it is his almost 20 years as a homicide detective in the district. Um, and then I, I thought there was a second part to your question, Judge McLeese, I apologize that I um, may not have remembered it. Um, well, I, I, I think oh, you relevant? were starting for oh, a hypothetical. Oh, sorry, the hypothetical. A, a single witness, not about a common misconception, but just corroborative. I'm not the only person in the world, you know, I, I, if I'm the defense attorney and I want to be able to say to the jury, look, my client didn't understand the law of self-defense. So what looks like consciousness of guilt really is just a misunderstanding of the law. And, so, you know, that might be counterintuitive to you, but other people believe that. And, you know, here's a, here's another witness who you might well like, you know, he's a very likable uh, witness who has the same mistake. Um, is that, is, would that also be logically relevant and admissible? That was the hypothetical. And I think, you know, we then got, I, my fault got uh, pushed off another topic. No, 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 also important and appreciate it. Um, so I think that the, uh, the other witness, some calling some guy to say, I don't know that self-defense exists is a lot less probative of um, Mr. DeQueer's state, like contention that it's just what's known in the district that self-defense doesn't exist. And obviously this random person wouldn't be able to say all the people that I talk to say that self-defense doesn't exist either. Why, why not? Or I guess, uh, I'm, I'm actually, I don't wanna engage with that. We know that uh, Detective Branson would have been able to um, speak from a point of authority um, and give an opinion that this is a this is a misconception that exists in, in DC. And we would have had the task to connect Mr. DeQueer to that misconception. Um, this is the far most, by far the most relevant way and the most powerful way that we could introduce this evidence. And it was properly admitted as lay witness opinion testimony. There was no legitimate basis for finding it more prejudicial than probative, and the court didn't really make that finding. And so, um, as a matter of law, this was admissible. Um, and um, the government doesn't doesn't challenge the notion that this was properly admitted as lay witness testimony. They say that it's hearsay. It isn't hearsay. And so, um, this court should find that this was um, an error. And the error was harmful. Just briefly. Uh, this was a very close case. This is a self-defense case where the decedent is armed with a shotgun um, and his friends are involved in the removal of that shotgun in the aftermath of the shooting. Um, and this is a case that hung twice on the issue of self-defense specifically, signaling that Mr. DeQueer's testimony is by and large very credible. Um, the main, uh, one of the main ways that they tried to attack Mr. DeQueer's credibility was this notion that it's crazy, it's ridiculous, to, it's preposterous to say that self-defense doesn't exist. Um, you know about obstruction of justice. This was uh, all a part of their cross. It was a lengthy period of their cross where they just attacked him on this particular issue. It also featured very prominently in their closing argument um, how absurd it is for him to say that self-defense doesn't exist. And um, this was went to one of the biggest problems in the defense case and Mr. DeQueer's testimony, which is explaining why he took the steps that he took in the aftermath of the shooting to cover up his involvement in it if he was innocent because of self-defense. And his explanation is, I just didn't know that that would be available to me. Um, and this was our most powerful way to corroborate it. If we had been able to call Detective Branson and he had said, this is a common misconception in DC, when the government said, 
it's preposterous to say that, they wouldn't have just been attacking Mr. DeQueer, they would have been attacking an MPD detective who said that this is a commonplace thing. So um, for all of those reasons, this was harmful and it was certainly error. Ms. Williams, I think you also mentioned the voir dire. Was that the other thing you, if you want to take a mi minute, um, uh, is that, did I, I get will, that right? I, that is the other issue that I wanted to mention briefly. And um, we've given you a lot of time, but just since I you know. mentioned it in your opening, if you want to just take a minute and Mr. Carroll, we will give you plenty of time as well. Um, yes, I'll just quickly say, um, so the trial court plainly aired when it failed to accurately inform the prospective jurors of the charges against Mr. DeQueer, omitting a highly prejudicial enhancement for killing a minor, which led to the removal for cause of three jurors at a previous trial. Um, because of this error, the jurors only learned the prejudicial nature of the charges during the government's opening, which heavily emphasized the fact that Mr. DeQueer was ac accused of, quote, murdering a child. Um, because a duty resides in the court to see that the jury has, as finally selected, is subject to no solid basis of objection on the score of impartiality. And here the procedure used for testing impartiality did not create a reasonable assurance that prejudice would be discovered if present. The court plainly erred. That error affected Mr. DeCure's substantial rights because um, it had a reasonable probability of affecting- Sorry, I know you're trying to get through it quickly and I'm perhaps prolonging this by asking a question. Um, no, please. Hopefully, uh, Judge Beckwith will allow me. H how do you square that with Cordero? Um, uh, how do I square that with Cordero? The, you know, as long as there's kind of a general question of, is there any other reason why, why you couldn't be impartial? Um, that's sort of the end of the inquiry. Um, so, um, apologies. Could you repeat that question? I, I the, the standard for harm that we 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 actually take that from Cordero. Um, so, I, and my understanding, and I, I should go back into the Cordero, is that you know if there's a general question that um, it, you know is there any other reason that could you that you could not be impartial, the court doesn't need to kind of make other additional kind of sua sponte specific questions. Oh, um, so is the, I, you might be referring to Barrows. Um, Okay. Perhaps it could be, I'm sorry. I was, no, 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 that's fine. I was, um, I'm relieved that you're talking about Barrows because I thought Cordero was very helpful to us. Um, so Barrows is a much different situation for two reasons. First of all, the error in Barrows was, um, and this was very much the focus of the court's decision. Um, essentially when a court decides to conduct for deer in a manner where they're allocating to the defense, the opportunity to ask uh, generic questions to the entire jury panel that are case specific, and they say that they are going to only ask the stock questions. In that situation, it is not their duty to sua sponte ask a, um, a question that is case specific related to bias um, when they've already given that to the defense. And you can't review that under plain error. Here, the, or, or you can, but the plain error, I guess, doesn't uh, plain error isn't really available to you in that situation. Um, what the um, error here was, was the court took it upon themselves, as they always do, to correctly state the charges. Um, and that is something that is historically within the court's control. It is not something over which defense counsel has discretion, and they did that incorrectly. Ask you, um, uh, I, I, I got interested in this topic because there, there are two ways of looking at it. One is the judge's error was not reading the charges correctly. And a judge has a duty to do that, and that was an obvious mistake. And then the, the plain error analysis follows from that. Another is more like a voir dire question. You know, the, the judge said more generally, this is a topic, uh, in, even if it hadn't been in the charges, uh, it's a topic that the judge would have been obliged to communicate to the jury. Um, so there are two different ways of looking at it. On the first of those, I was interested, I started looking around, the parties didn't really cite anything that said the judge, it's one of the things a judge is supposed to do at the beginning of a trial is accurately like read the indictment in its entirety to the jury before jury selection. Um, there's some, like California seems to have a requirement like that as far as I can tell, but I didn't see that we have a rule that says that or a case that says, judge, you know, before you conduct voir dire, you need to make sure the jury has heard the charges completely. You can't kind of generally say, well, it's homicide or something like that. You got to, you know, all the all the details. Um, do, do, are you aware of any legal uh, source of legal requirement for a judge before jury selection to fully apprise the potential jurors of the charges reflected in the charging document? So um, our uh, basis for that, there 
we agree we are not aware of any rule that requires the court to do that, um, in the district at least, but um, we cited cases, historical cases that talk about sort of the, um, the basically the base principles of uh, impartial juries and voir dire and its development and what was required of the court at that most basic level then. And it was that they correctly read the charges or inform the jury of the charges. That was sort of the baseline thing that they need to do. And it is, um, I think this court can look to the requirement that um, the uh, voir dire procedure be governed by um, essential demands of fairness to get to the fact that telling the jury what the charges are, the thing that they're going to need to find beyond a reasonable doubt is something that is at, a, at, a, at its most basic level required in order to understand if this jury is capable of being impartial with respect to the matters it needs to decide. It is not- On that, on that way of looking at it, it would make a difference. Imagine that this case had involved you know, the, the, the uh, killing of a child as it did, but there wasn't a corresponding enhancement. I, t I take it from what the distinction, a part of the distinction you were drawing about Barrows is that failure to read that part of the charge in this case might be plain error, whereas failure to sua sponte advise the jury about that circumstance might, uh, where it wasn't included in the charging document might well uh, not be plain error. Is, is that, am I, am I getting that uh, distinction correctly? Because if that's true, then it does seem a bit of a puzzle since the, the risk of prejudice seems equal, why the plain error analysis output would be different is seems um, a little unclear. So I think that um, the, I, I, I think that part of the, the issue here is this case would perhaps look different if we were saying that this involved a, a a homicide victim who was a child and um, no question was asked, that would look a lot more like Barrows. Here, what we're saying is the, the defense counsel relied on its belief that the charges would be correctly stated and that the charges plus a catch-all question at the end would sufficiently flag for the jury the, nature, the prejudicial nature of the charges and get them to reflect on whether or not they would have the capacity for impartiality. If this was a situation where the um, the facts of the case, divorced from the actual charge itself, um, evoked some sort of bias that would potentially, in, in light of Barrows, place different um, requirements on defense counsel. But here, that is not the case that we have. We have a case where the charges themselves and what the jury needs to find beyond a reasonable doubt is prejudicial. And we're at two previous trials the court correctly stated the charges and they were able to secure juries that did not have issues with crimes against children such that they would be incapable of being impartial in light of the evidence. Um, and so the defense counsel, they were inattentive, they failed, that's why we're here under plain air, but they reasonably perhaps relied on the notion that the court's gonna correctly state the charges and we know that that's gonna cover any concerns about bias with respect to children. So. Um, it's they, they got that question in the second trial, right? So it's kind of strange to me from a plain error perspective, like they were sort of on notice that it was important to them. So does that kind of factor into our consideration of plain error here? No, it doesn't. Um, they, the question, so what the first two trials told them is that this is an effective way of vetting this kind of bias. Um, at the first trial, they got a jury that did not have a problem looking at the evidence impartially, even though the victim was a child, and that's why Mr. DeQueer was acquitted on the top charges and only convicted of the conduct that he admitted to, or, or the conduct underlying that he admitted to on the stand. At the second trial, three jurors were able to be vetted um, because of the their awareness of the nature of the charges. Um, and two came forward and said, look, I, I just cannot be objective when you're dealing with a crime against a child. And those people were removed. The remaining jury was apparently seemingly um, unbiased with respect to this. It was perfectly reasonable for defense counsel to rely on that same process to work again at the third trial where they aired was not noticing that the enhancement was dropped from the description of the charges at the third trial. Um, Thank you for your indulgence. Um, and uh, 
I'll reserve the remainder of my time. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Williams. You have no time to reserve, but we will still give you some time for rebuttal. And Mr. Carroll, we will hear from you. All right, good morning, Your Honors. Um, my name is Ethan Carroll and I represent the United States. Um, the evidence here, I'm gonna turn first to the obstruction issue. Um, the evidence here where appellant corruptly persuaded other people uh, was sufficient to establish obstruction under 722A6, the language of which is plain, broad, and nearly identical in all relevant respects to the federal omnibus clause of 18 uh, USC section 1503. As under 1503, so long as the government proves first a specific intent to obstruct an official proceeding, and that has to be second at a time when there is in fact a pending official proceeding, then the local omnibus clause reaches corrupt acts that in any way endeavor to obstruct or impede the due administration of justice in any official proceeding. But why, um, would, why would the council create um, a crime that carries with it a 30 year sentence that appears to be identical to the tampering three year crime? It's not identical. Um, so the well, major close, right? So no, the, the major difference is that tampering uh, applies to, uh, encompasses preliminary street investigations. Um, so investigations just by the police when there, when there is no uh, official proceeding um, to obstruct, whereas uh, obstruction of justice requires not only that there be, uh, requires that there be a pending official proceeding. That makes a huge difference. Um, and the council could reasonably determine uh, that that is a sufficiently weighty um, uh, uh, fact to, to make a difference. I would also note that this court has um, uh, looked at this kind of question before. So in, um, I believe it was Smith versus uh, United States, the DC, uh, DC court, uh, well, this court's case from 2013, um, the question was raised whether uh, the um, charges of perjury and uh, whether there was a charge of perjury and then um, uh, obstruction brought under the, the uh, A6 provision. Um, and one of the arguments was because the perjury statute only um, carried a penalty of 10 years, whereas the obstruction of justice statute carried a penalty of 30 years, um, then obstruction should not uh, carry or should not criminalize the same kind of conduct. And this court rejected that reasoning um, and uh, reasoned that as in every, as in a, a number of um, um, areas of, uh, of the criminal code, there are multiple, there may be no, uh, multiple statutes that criminalize similar conduct, but there are different interests that are at issue. Um, I do want to emphasize uh, that the that appellant's argument has shifted over time. Um, so at trial, the argument was that there was a distinction between people and, um, and objects. Um, and that was the same argument in the opening brief. In the reply brief, it shifted to um, uh, people being objects of um, the obstruction. And now there's a, a new argument um, at oral argument, which is that the obstruction has to target an, a judicial actor. Um, this court should reject appellant's opportunity to once again, uh, create a new set of ad hoc rules to address the arguments that the government is putting forth. Um, this isn't something, this isn't a theory that Mr. was raised. Mr. Carroll, uh, what if uh, the defendant himself had moved the guns? Yeah. Would that fall into the catch all as well? Um, so first, obviously, we don't think that's necessary because he corruptly persuaded Ms. Schuler and Ms. Graves. Um, but yes, if he himself removed the guns after there was an official proceeding pending with the intent to obstruct that official proceeding, then yes, he could be guilty of obstruction as well. It's just, it's just not a question that the court needs to reach because he corruptly persuaded both Schuler and Graves um, to take those actions on his behalf um, after the official proceeding was pending. Yeah, I mean, my hypothetical is trying to get at that. That seems to me to be pretty squarely tampering. And so it, it seems like you're kind of penalizing under two different statutes, very identical conduct. That might also be tampering. Um, but the key difference is that there is an official proceeding that is pending and he, we would have to also prove the specific intent to, um, uh, to impede or uh, to impede the, the uh, official proceeding. Um, so there are uh, important safeguards. Um, I, to you, was, you said, I thought the tampering also required an intent. Uh, it might be slightly different, I guess, is to impair integrity or availability for use in a proceeding, but it seems yes. like the intent provisions are pretty indistinguishable. Are you suggesting there's significant differences on the intent side? So um, I'm, I don't think this court has actually decided that issue. Um, and we think that the much more important uh, limitation is the pendency of an official proceeding. 
Um, but I'm not aware of the court having actually addressed whether these are the same specific intent requirement. In Crutchfield, the 2001 case from this court, the, the court addressed the specific intent to, uh, under, the, under A6. Um, but I'm not aware of whether it's addressed the same issue under the tapering statute. Um, but the pendency of an official proceeding um, does make, it, it is dispositive. Can you explain why as a policy matter, the penalty would depend so heavily on sort of when the proceeding was started? Sure. Um, so as a, as a policy matter, my understanding is just that the uh, pendency of an official proceeding makes a big difference. What obstruction, what the obstruction of justice uh, statute prohibits, I'll, I'll quote language from, um, I believe it's Howard, the Fifth Circuit case from 1978, um, which is acts that are similar in result rather than a manner to the conduct described in the other parts of the statute. So the fact that the result is to impair the due administration of justice um, because there is a official, an official proceeding that's pending and the defendant is acting with the intent to obstruct that official proceeding um, is a reasonable legislative determination. Um, another Fifth Circuit case from 1979, uh, Griffin, or United States versus Griffin, um, indicates that the variety of corrupt methods by which the proper administration of justice can be impeded or thwarted is one that's limited only by the imagination of the criminally inclined. Um, so you, you, about the first point you made, you seem to suggest that one uh, reason for uh, harsher sentences for obstruction might be because of the, there'd be a result of obstruction or, or interference. But I thought the obstruction statute does not require any actually resultant obstruction. Uh, it requires an intent, uh, uh, you know, you can obstruct or impede or endeavor to. Uh, and so uh, uh, the penalty provision doesn't seem tied to an actual resultant obstruction as opposed to uh, it seems to equate actual obstruction and endeavors, even if they don't result in actual obstruction. Am I missing something? Or? Um, no, you're not. Um, I was not speaking about, uh, I guess, the liability differences. There is no requirement of, uh, of there's no result element. I was um, in response to Judge Alicon's question. I was uh, talking about the policy reasons a well, legislature I, might think that. Was, Right, but her question was like, why? Why is there? Why would a reasonable legislature have a three-year penalty for tampering and a thirty-year penalty uh, for the, uh, the very similar conduct as long as an official proceeding is pending? And I thought part of your explanation of that had to do with the obstruction statute requires resulting obstruction, and that's where I got lost. So I may you have. No, some it would it would be acts that uh, that tend to have that effect. Um, a legislature could. Um, reasonably de determine that with the pendency of an official proceeding um, and uh, that, 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 that is conduct, that whatever conduct someone who uh, is, uh, that, let me strike that, that whatever conduct someone is taking that would uh, tend to impair um, or that, that would endeavor to impair uh, or uh, um, uh, the rest of the language of the statute, right, the, <laughs> uh, the due administration of justice. I mean, tampering doesn't, you're quite right, doesn't require that there actually be an official proceeding, but it's pretty darn close. I mean, you're right at the threshold of it because the defendant has to not just believe, but know if there isn't an actual proceeding, the defendant has, uh, um, uh, well, um, well, maybe uh, at least one part of it requires knowing that an official proceeding is likely to be instituted. Now, I, I was just looking at the wording of it and I got a little confused, so maybe you can help me out. Is it enough if... Uh, if the defendant has reason to believe an official proceeding has begun, even if the defendant is wrong, um, or does the defendant have to, uh, does there have to be one or the defendant knows one is likely, or is there a third possibility, which is the defendant believes whether rightly or wrongly that one exists? Uh, under when this court held that there had to be an official proceeding um, that was pending for the obstruction statute. And uh, uh, these, no oh, for tampering. Um, for, for tampering, I, I haven't looked into that issue. I'm sorry, I've been focused on A6. I do want to tie this back to the plain language of the statute. These questions of um, legislative intent, the legislative history um, surrounding provisions are, are interesting, um, but they only act, can overcome the plain meaning of the statute if they're inconsistent with what is plain, uh, what is broad, and what is nearly identical to the, the federal statute. Um, and that is that so long as these threshold requirements are met of specific intent and the pendency of a, an official proceeding, then um, uh, any endeavor um, to obstruct justice uh, falls within the bounds of the statute. Um, and again, 
uh, the kinds of obstruction that that might include um, is as only limited by the criminal imagination. Um, I, uh, are there any questions on, on that aspect of, of things? Um, and I, I guess I, the other, only other thing I wanted to, to note about this part of the argument is that all of uh, the, the, the new defense arguments um, about this being targeted at a judicial actor focus on the word withholding in A2B. Um, and most, most of the discussion this court was having with uh, my friend on the other side was about A2B. Um, and A2B, or sorry, A6 must be construed in a way that doesn't render it superfluous. So um, the, the questions that the court posed of, uh, of opposing counsel on A2B are all well and good. Um, but even on, a, say, a, a near miss theory of uh, the, um, the omnibus clause, um, just because the word, word withholding is an A2B does not mean that A6 um, would uh, not encompass acts of removal. And we've cited a, a variety of federal cases um, where acts that are taken to remove documents or make them unavailable um, uh, so long as there is an official proceeding uh, pending. Um, Mr. Carroll, or obstruction. I'm sorry. Is your point in um, referring a couple of times to the um, new arguments or evolving arguments to suggest some kind of, of waiver or forfeiture because why isn't this, or, you know, you must have some, I, I wonder what the end result of your comments is um, because it seems sort of like arguments in support of a claim, ye versus Escondido, why is it different from that? Um, so this court often will refuse to consider new arguments raised for the first time uh, at oral argument, even if they result from uh, the same claim. And that's all I'm saying um, is that uh, appellant should be bound by the arguments that um, they've made uh, in, in the past to support this claim. Um, Could I take to, you to Anthony Ryan's? Uh, I know we've had you up for a while. Um, so I mean, yep. I, I, candidly, I, that, that issue is very troubling to me. It seems like you did not do any Thing to find him in the immediate uh, run up to the third trial. And clearly you knew how important he would be given that you had been trying to uh, get, make this, this charge or some variation of it stick for two other trials and had been unsuccessful. So I guess there's not really a question in there, but <laughs> tell, tell me why that's not a problem because it strikes me that this is a, a pretty, pretty bad situation. Uh, sure, so um, uh, we made a mistake in thinking that Mr. Rines was still incarcerated. Um, we've uh, noted that in our brief, um, and there was a good reason for that. This was a man who, um, at the second trial, uh, which ended in March 2018, um, had been on parole for armed robbery and had uh, been uh, arrested for a new robbery um, that he was being detained for. Um, and so we just didn't have any expectation that a person with those serious charges would be able to um, just four months later, plead down to grand larceny and be released to probation the very same day. Um, that happened on July 25th. Um, and that was well before, um, we started preparing for trial. That was well before the trial date even, um, was rescheduled from, um, April 29th to, uh, April 1st. Um, so, so we did make a mistake, um, but it's not a problem because of the findings that, um, that Judge Esco made uh, about the efforts that the government undertook. They were considerable and strong, to quote the April 23rd. So I get your point that there was a mistake at the front end. Yes. Um, and then at some point though, it's trial prep time and the prosecutor is thinking, okay, I'm gonna uh, you know, gather my forces. And when, what does the record show about what date that was relative to the trial date when the trial court focused on, when the trial prosecutor focused on Mr. Ryan's and securing his availability? Um, so as I understand things, we moved to continue the trial date because we were having trouble locating witnesses in um, March, I think it was March 3rd of 2019. Um, and then on March 25th, we renewed our motion to uh, continue the trial date, um, which the defense opposed and then was, um, uh, Denied in part by Judge Esco, and then, and, the, and the, the trial date that you were seeking to remove uh, to postpone was in April. It was yes. It was um, by that point it had shifted from April 29th to April 1st. And 
am, am I right to infer from the fact that you haven't during that intervening time said anything about efforts before then that there's nothing in the record about any efforts to locate or secure the presence of Mr. Ryan up to the point of the filing of the motion to move the trial? Um, there's nothing in the record about it. No. That seems, um, yeah, I mean, so I, I get the point about the first mistake. What's the explanation for no indication of any, you know, no indication in the record of any effort to secure Mr. Ryan's presence or find his whereabouts up until, uh, you know, uh, uh, less than a month or a month uh, before uh, a homicide trial? Sure. So I can only speak to what's in the record, um, which is that the lead prosecutor was in a lengthy um, rape and um, homicide trial that was scheduled before a different judge after the trial date um, had been rescheduled uh, from April 29th to April 1st. Um, and the second chair prosecutor had been detailed to another office. What I, I do want to bring the court back to uh, the record uh, and Judge Esco's findings, which is that Judge Esco had no reason just to believe- make, Just to make- I, I was. Th I thought that the questions we were asking right now were about the record, but uh, they're not. Or I, no, I'm bringing you back to the court's findings. My apologies yeah. for misspeaking. Um, which is that uh, Judge Esco had no reason to believe that um, more diligent or uh, extended efforts would have been successful, and that there was nothing uh, in what the U.S. Marshal Service had provided Judge Esco that led him to think that earlier efforts would have been more successful. So Judge Esco did, in a comprehensive manner, go through um, whether more diligent efforts, whether earlier efforts, whether stronger efforts um, would have been more successful. And ultimately, what he concluded is, is that no, um, they wouldn't. And uh, on, the, on that factual question, um, there's evidence to support it, and it's not clearly erroneous. What is the evidence to support it? Can you remind me? Sure. Um, this. So um, we've listed it in much more detail than I'm able to do right now in our brief. Um, but we um, called Mr. Ryan's. We tried to reach out to him on Facebook, the method that had been successful in the past. We called and emailed the mother of his children, um, who at the time we did that, um, we thought was still his fiance. Um, we did the same, calling an email the Bennettsville woman with which he was with whom he was living in the spring of uh, 2018. Um, uh, we so is the idea that he's trying not to be located? Is this what Judge Isco as, said? So as Judge Isco um, also said, he had every so he had a, an independent reason from this trial to to be in hiding, um, and that was his um, uh, the the pending warrants and his misconduct in uh, South Carolina. Um, and importantly, that, that isn't anything that's related to, to this case. Um, and um, I, 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 there, there is much more that we did that's, that's in our brief. I don't think it's the best use of my time to yeah, can I ask address yeah. it all now. Your opponent's, one line of thinking in your opponent's response is, if you uh, had started earlier, I mean, he, he, people are found on warrants all the time. So that he has a, d a desire not to be found does not mean he can't be found. People, that, you know, that's their whole apparatus of the government whose job it is to find people who don't want to be found. And if you had started earlier, you would, there's every reason to suppose you would have found him. And if you had found him, there's every reason to suppose he would have then been answerable to several warrants, which would have meant that even though he didn't seem to want to cooperate, you would have been able to compel his cooperation thereafter. And that the record doesn't really suffice to support a conclusion that none of that is true. Um, uh, so what's your response to that line of thinking? Uh, sure, so my, my response is that efforts that begin six months before trial, as, as my friend on the other side was saying, um, aren't required of the government. Um, in Williams versus the United States, a 2005 uh, case from, from this court, um, the government uh, learned just a few weeks before trial that uh, an important witness had been deported. Um, it was an ID witness who had partially partially recanted after after the trial. Um, so the the so there was a even stronger case um, of of prejudice. Um, so uh, my response is just that the the um, I guess the the government just isn't required to to start looking um, six months before trial. Well. Fair enough, but when do you think the government, I mean, there's no particular date, I guess, on which the government is required. There's no stat, rule or statute that says <laughs> your witness must begin by date X. So that's fair as far as it goes. But if, you know, if the question is, your opponent's argument is, uh, rather than starting in earnest mid-trial, perhaps, 
uh, if there had been, you know, if you'd started reasonably before trial, let's say a month before trial or two weeks before trial, there's every reason to suppose that the skilled investigators uh, that you have would have been able to find uh, um, Mr. Ryan's and that he would have then been called to answer his warrants and would have been uh, available to proceeding. Um, so I'm not sure saying there's no requirement six months is a full response to that line of uh, uh, sure. argument by your Sure. So, so we have cited um, in, a, in a lengthy footnote just the um, uh, a number of cases where um, efforts that began a week or two before trial um, were deemed reasonable. Um, and I want to tie this back again to Judge Isco's um, findings, which were that uh, earlier efforts, there's no reason to think that earlier efforts would have been successful. Um, and after Mr. Ryan stole, uh, committed a new crime by stealing pills from the woman with which he was with whom he was living in, in Bennettsville, which happened on uh, December 30th or 31st, I'm not sure, but it's in the record in the uh, arrest warrant affidavit, um, we, we wouldn't have been able to find him. Um, and that's something that happened four, four months before trial. I understand that. Why, what do you mean you wouldn't have been able to find him? There are people whose job it is to find, you know, people are found all the time who are not interested in being found. So I just don't know why. I have no idea whether a concerted effort by uh, folks who gave it a high priority would have been able to find him or not. Uh, it, it, it was a high priority. We looked for, um, uh, for a lengthy period of time and made considerable efforts after um, we knew that we were going to trial in the case. Um, again, we recognized that our mistake was not um, was a not uh, not realizing earlier that Mr. Bynes was no longer incarcerated. Um, well, but you're speaking in the singular, but it seems like there were at least two problems. One was not realizing that, and the other was perhaps because of the press of other business and other complications, not getting started in trying to locate him until uh, quite belatedly relative to the uh, the third trial. Sure. I, I do just want to bring this back again to Judge Isco's findings on this issue, um, which was that he did not have a reason to think that earlier um, efforts or more extended efforts um, would have been more successful. This court might believe otherwise. Um, and if it were looking at it de novo, it might find otherwise, but that's not the relevant standard of review here. Um, that's a factual finding um, that is not clearly uh, erroneous. And I, I do want to emphasize uh, that point. Um, to, if there are no further questions on um, this issue, um, I believe the next one my, my friend discussed was uh, the um, detective's testimony. Let me just get to that. Um, so one part of this I, I want to emphasize um, is that the proceedings between the defense and Judge Esco took part ex parte and under seal. Um, and the government was never asked for its input on the correct resolution of um, whether Detect Detective Branson should testify. Um, and so this is actually our first opportunity to, to weigh in. Um, so I, I, in response to uh, the reply brief where um, Appellant argues that there would be some procedural unfairness by allowing us to, to address this issue, um, we don't think that it is procedurally unfair. Um, the easiest way for this court to resolve this issue is um, to uh, defer to Judge Isco's balancing of the uh, relevance of Detective Branson's testimony versus the uh, substantial danger of undue prejudice that it would oppose. Um, on, on the relevance side of things, um, fortunately, Judge Isco took it upon himself to um, review the transcript of Detective Branson's testimony from uh, United States versus Becton. Um, and so uh, he was aware that um, uh, Detective Branson had importantly qualified his um, testimony there in a number of respects. He had said things such as, I don't know what everyone knows. He had never said that he had talked to a wide variety of witnesses and lay people. Um, there just wasn't testimony about who he had talked to. Um, unlike the defense proffer. Um, and Judge uh, Isco reasonably found that, um, uh, that Detective Branson's testimony about what unknown other people might think about self-defense had very limited relevance where um, appellant who had already testified um, uh, had not been asked about um, the, the basis for his knowledge. Um, well, do you Judge agree Isco it's wrong, I mean, uh... If, if I am uh, trying to persuade a jury to credit my testimony that I believe something that isn't true, 
and it's relevant to, you know, as the jury, it's relevant to my defense, uh, as I think is the case here. Um, is it relevant uh, to try to introduce evidence that that's not just an implausible claim by me, but it, 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 my claim is corroborated to a degree by the fact that either, you know, that proved one way or another, that's a misconception that others have. So it, it might have minimal relevance. It would still need to come in in a way that is admissible, and it would also need to not be um, outweighed by the substantial danger of undue prejudice, the likelihood of confusing issues or of leading to a trial within a trial. I, get, um, the, I understand the, 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 the first qualification, which would have to be otherwise be admissible. I want to make sure I understand where, we, where the state of play is on that, because yeah. uh, I take you as not contesting that it would have been admissible under the lay opinion rules. Um, and I uh, took you to argue in your brief about hearsay, but I haven't heard you mention that today. And uh, your opponent raises uh, what seems like a difficulty for you on a, about a hearsay theory. So do you think it was inadmissible under some principle of law other than Rule 403? Uh, we do think it was inadmissible um, as, as hearsay. Um, United States versus Lloyd, the uh, 2015 case from the Ninth Circuit, is almost directly on point uh, on this. Um, and we just uh, encourage you to take a look at that. Um, it was another case where uh, defend, where I think it was actually, uh, the government was arguing that a witness's testimony about what declarant others heard or knew um, was not hearsay. Um, they wanted to bring that in because it went to the defendant's state of mind. So um, we were saying that people in this office um, who had heard the defendant um, uh, basically emailing others and, and um, um, encouraging others to, to invest with him, um, had told him um, that, um, that what he was saying was false. Um, and so there was actually a much more um, direct tie to the defendant's state of mind. And what the Ninth Circuit said there was that actually that is still hearsay because whether um, it had any relevance to what he knew turned on whether um, what he was saying was in fact false. I know that's a, a kind of convoluted I would encourage you to take a look at that. It is pretty much you explain, point. I mean, I, so your opponent's argument, uh, leaving aside Lloyd and convolutions, had a straightforward structure to it. Yeah. And you can tell me where it goes wrong. Okay. It is that, um, you know, uh, not all jurisdictions are quite, take the, the, the same approach to this topic, but your opponent's argument is in this jurisdiction, to be hearsay, evidence has to be being admitted for the truth of the matter asserted. And their argument is that uh, the, the you know, evidence that um, uh, other people expressed the view to Detective Branson, Branson that there is no right of self-defense, assuming again, that's a fair summary of his proffer, the, you know, the testimony, which one could debate, but uh, um, uh, is not being introduced for the truth of the matter those people were asserting. Uh, because the premise of it is that it's a, it's a misconception. So it just can't be hearsay because of a, a basic requirement of hearsay law in this jurisdiction. Now, we, sure. I leave aside Lloyd. Is it your view that actually uh, that isn't a flat requirement and this would be an exception to that requirement? Or is your view that, that it actually was hearsay in light of that requirement in some way that I'm not sure I quite follow yet? Uh, the latter. Um, so it would be... Um... Uh, what we would hear about in that situation is whether or not they actually think that self-defense um, is not a defense. So let's say that Detective Benson only speaks to defendants and only in the context of people who had been arrested for, for shooting people. Um, if they all say, well, I didn't know self-defense was an issue, um, it would be much less primitive and there would be reasons to um, uh, question whether or not they actually believe that self-defense is a defense. Um, so we care about the truth of what they're saying. Um, and the reason that it would be relevant to this well, proceeding is for the truth of that. Yeah, so, so I get that line of thought and that does it depend on the wording of what was said? So if um, uh, um, I, I, if I understand your point, tell me if I'm getting it. If De Detective Branson, Branson is coming in and saying, someone told me several people have told me that they didn't think there was a law of self-defense. Then if you're putting in that testimony to prove that they believe, you know, that what they said was true. They said they didn't believe in the law of self-defense and it's true. They don't believe in the law of self-defense. That's a hearsay problem. Whereas if I, I, if that's your argument, I can see how statements like that worded that way might well present a hearsay issue. But if instead they just said there is no law of self-defense, um, 
then uh, they're not making a, state, a direct statement about their belief. And you're trying to prove that their statement is you're, that they believed it, but you're not, they didn't say they believed it. You're just, they said it and you're trying to prove that, uh, you know, implicitly they believed it. Um, you're, you still think that's hearsay. It doesn't depend on the wording of it. Uh, it's all a question of however, whatever is explicitly asserted in the statement, it's hearsay because implicit is a statement of belief or I just want to so, try to understand the conceptual theory. Yeah, so um, uh, the, the wording of what they said would be less important than the implied statement. So in Grimes versus United States, uh, 2020 case from this court, um, we tried to make the distinction between um, what was said and what was implied, and this court rejected that uh, distinction and said it's the implication that matters. So the implication of saying there is no law of self-defense, um, if someone is saying it in response to um, an allegation that they shot someone, it's the exact same thing as saying, I don't believe that there is a law of self-defense. So it's the implication of what they're saying that uh, would matter for, for the hearsay part. Um, but I, the, the, the reason that I did not lead with this is because we do think that the 403 bouncing here um, is a much easier path to affirmance um, and um, is one that's committed to the discretion of the trial court. Um, I've, I've discussed the, the lack of um, relevance uh, or the, the mil minimal relevance um, uh, to what Detective Branson uh, had to offer, um, as indicated in his transcript in, 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 uh, in Becton. Um, on the substantial danger of undue prejudice, the potential for a, a trial within a trial, um, as Judge Esco found out, it, that kind of, this kind of testimony from Detective Branson would have been uh, likely to mislead the jury and to confuse issues um, for the reason that it would, have con it would have conflated what the defendant knew, which is the actual relevant part of this versus what other people knew without any um, tie between the, two thing, between the two things or a very marginal tie um, between uh, the, the two different points. I'm not following you there. So, I, I mean, I, the, what the defense is trying to do is that, you know, the, the defendant is coming in and saying, I didn't think there was self-defense and he's concerned that juries might be skeptical that that's true and wants to try to say, look, jury, you may think that's an odd belief, but you may not be aware that there are a number of other people who believe that. I don't see what's intrinsically confusing about any of that. And I don't see how it's different in logical structure than other kinds of evidence that uh, we're comfortable with where you know, experts might come in about uh, evidence of battery and uh, the consequences of battery where the United States might be concerned that the jury will be one, you know, the, 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 the witness, uh, a, a complaining witness might say, yes, I had been battered before, but I didn't feel like I could leave. And the, 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 the um, uh, United States might be concerned that the jury will think, well, oh no, of course you can leave. I, uh, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, and the United States will want to put on an expert who will say, no, that's a very common set of beliefs for people who are in that situation. And so don't view it skeptically, jury. Um, and, you know, we accept evidence of that kind uh, without thinking that it is somehow unmanageable or incomprehensible to a jury. And I'm not sure why the evidence here would have been. Sure. But that's not actually what Detective Branson would have testified to. Um, and Judge Esco knew that because he had gone and reviewed um, Detective Branson's testimony in Beckton and saw the qualifications, saw um, that it was um, that Detective Branson's testimony was limited to a particular issue. Um, Judge Esco distinguished uh, Beckton from this case. Right, well, um, limited to what particular issue? Um, it was the reason why he explains to defendants when he interviews them, um, uh, or sorry, to a particular defendant um, when he was interviewing him, why he uh, told him about self defense. Um, I'm not sure I follow your, I mean, whatever the context of it was viewed in the best, the light best for the defense. And there were very, you know, there are other uh, options. So I recognize that, but uh, at one point he seemed to say, for whatever reasons it was relevant in the trial, he seemed to say that oftentimes people, uh, uh, I forget where this was qualified by the district, people in the district, uh, you know, think there isn't a right of self-defense. That's a paraphrase. But the word off times, I believe is, is the word that's there. Um, why does it matter what the issue was in, you know, that was the context for that in the earlier trial? The defense's point here is that's what I want to tell a jury. I want to tell the jury in this case, don't think my client is lying just because my client is telling you something that might be a surprise to you that you believe because there's an MPD detective who will say oftentimes uh, uh, other people have expressed that view to me. Well, I, 
I'm not quite sure why the context of the other trial is germane to whether that would have been relevant or admissible or manageable. Um, so uh, I guess it goes to the, the second part of 403. Um, just uh, the, the So what Detective Branson would have actually said matters to uh, the court's um, uh, to the court's 403 balancing, right? Um, so as Your Honor has also noted, there were important qualifications um, in Detective Branson's testimony, and so it just wouldn't have been as powerful as um, appellant has argued. That's that's the point I'm trying to make. Um, th there's also just the potential for uh, on a collateral issue of um, uh, not the issue of self-defense itself, but on the issue of consciousness of guilt, we're now getting into Detective Branson's testimony in a whole different trial, which then the government would have been entitled to rebut with its own witness. Um, and it would have led to uh, a, a waste of time and distraction of issues and a trial within a, within a trial. So the same kind of issues that um, are proper for consideration under 403. Um, so uh, Judge Isco's balancing of uh, the minimal relevance of this evidence versus um, its uh, 403 uh, interest effects um, uh, wasn't an abuse of discretion. And even if it was, um, the, any error wasn't harmless. Um, in part, it's for a number of the same reasons that I've mentioned under the 403 side of the equation. Um, the fact that the testimony would have been much less helpful um, than appellant believes, um, as indicated by the testimony in, in, in Becton, um, the fact that it wasn't connected up to appellant's um, belief. So appellant testified about word on the street, um, but not about, but wasn't asked any further questions by the defense um, for reasons that Judge Esco found had been tactical. Um, it also, um, by the fact that the defendant didn't just tell this to the police. So if um, the defendant really didn't believe that self-defense existed, we would expect him to not have lied to his girlfriend, to his mother. We would have also expected him not to keep lying even after he had counsel. Um, so the fact that this belief was um, perpetrated by him, or sorry, this, this, this lie uh, was one that he spread about to people other than the police, um, which are the only people that he would have a, a motive to lie to. Um, as far as consciousness of guilt goes, um, is, is another reason that we would have been able to, to point out that this um, uh, ultimately wasn't to be believed. Um, Mr. Carroll, could I invite you to jump to, I think, the last issue that Ms. Williams addressed? Sure. Um, so on the um, issue of Wadir, just one short brief indulgence while I turn to this part of my outline. Um, so on April 3rd, um, the court sent the parties that's proposed voir dire. Um, that's in our supplemental appendix and cited in our brief. Um, and it said that the defendant uh, is charged with the offenses of second degree murder while armed in possession of a firearm during a crime of violence. Um, defense counsel two days later in court on April 5th said, we're fine uh, with the proposed voir dire except for um, they requested the deletion of the sort of catch-all question. Um, so they'd actually read the court's proposed voir dire, um, proposed that something be deleted uh, or amended from it. Um, and they got what they requested, which was that uh, question number 12 in the proposed voir dire um, was deleted. Um, the court then read the voir dire as proposed by the, as approved by the defense. Um, and there's no plain error in, in doing that. Um, judges aren't supposed to sua sponte pose questions about potential areas of, of bias. Um, that's the teaching of Rosales Lopez um, the, uh, versus United States, the Supreme Court case from uh, 1981. If Judge Esco had started sua sponte um, posing questions about that, he, he very well uh, might have erred. Um, so doing what the defense had approved and not asking any further questions was not uh, erroneous, and it certainly was not plainly erroneous. If there are no okay. further questions on that, um, I would ask that the uh, this court affirm um, the conviction. Convictions, Thank sorry. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Um, Thank Ms. you. Ms. Williams, uh, we will give you three minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Uh, just uh, very briefly. Um, so, um, 
I want to go back to why we referred to the Bill of Particulars and uh, why that's appropriate given our claim here. The government indicted this case in a certain fashion. They did not indict it as corrupt persuasion of his friends. They indicted it as moving guns. The obstructive act was the removal of the guns and they're in a, the failure for those guns to be brought in into an official proceeding. Um, that I think is decisively making turning this into tampering with physical evidence and not even by the government's um, uh, what the government seems to be saying obstruction under the due administration of justice clause um, the um, the notion that pendency of an official proceeding is the distinguishing factor between three years versus 30 years and tampering versus um, the obstruction statute we think that that's a very unreasonable notion the idea that if you're running with a gun and you toss it um, that is three years, but if after arrest you kicked it into a storm drain, that is 30, um, is, uh, I think, I think that that is an irrational and unreasonable, uh, belief that that was what the legislature was anticipating. Um, I think that it's also inconsistent with the legislative history of the tampering statute, which is, as Judge McLeese noted, and other judges noted, very focused on this notion that a if, if an official proceeding isn't already pending, it needs to be extremely imminent. They are concerned with people who are preventing evidence, physical evidence, from being introduced at official proceedings. That was the point of passing the tampering statute um, in 1982. You can find that in the legislative history there. Um, and I'd also just like to make the point that this is not 1503. This is being legislated very differently um, with different legislative history, different statutory scheme, um, 1503 was passed with the intent that it would cover tampering with physical evidence in 1948 because there was no tampering evidence with physical evidence in the federal law. Um, here, when they overhauled the statute in 1982, they made the decision that tampering with physical evidence, there was going to be a separate statute that dealt with that to fill that void, and obstruction of justice was going to be limited explicitly to acts against um, individuals, judicial actors. I'd also just like to point out that um, this, I'm using judicial actors as shorthand to reference what we discussed in our reply brief, which is uh, people who are engaged in the judicial process. So um, this isn't new in oral argument. Um, on the lay witness opinion testimony point, um, uh, I would just like to make just a few very brief points. Um, the court did say that if this came in under expert testimony, that it might be relevant. Um, this was not a finding by the court that this could not be relevant uh, based on the nature of the testimony itself as he read it. Um, it was clearly a concern with the fact that this was being incorrectly brought in as lay witness opinion testimony. Uh, th there are many quotes in our brief about um, this concern with how witness, how jurors would be able to assess the reliability of that opinion testimony. Um, and to the extent that we didn't connect it to what Mr. DeQueer said, he said that it is, quote, just what is known in DC. He didn't have a person who told him that. It is just a thing that is known. And that's why Detective Branson's testimony would be particularly powerful, because he would have been speaking to that notion that this is just what's known. This is a misconception. It is broad. It is not a attached to a particular person. Um, the 403, there was no 403 finding here. I just wanna emphasize there was no finding that this is more substantially more prejudicial than probative to the extent that the court noted any kind of prejudice. The prejudice as the government concedes was um, the government would have been permitted in rebuttal to call another detective who would have testified differently and the jury would have had no way of assessing the reliability of either detective's opinion. That isn't a statement, a concern with a rabbit hole or a mini trial, that's a concern with the jury's inability to assess the, the weight that it should be giving to this opinion. And that is very rooted in the court's belief that if you're not bringing this in under an expert, juries aren't going to know what to do with this, um, this kind of opinion testimony. And that is wrong as a matter of law. Um, so there is no sort of alternative 403 ruling for the court to affirm here. So um, I guess, can I point you to page, I think it's like 308 and 309 of that April 30th transcript? Yes. Um, if you so I mean, he sorry, goes through his analysis and in particular it says, if it would be relevant, the danger of unfair prejudice outweighs any probative value and it opens the door to a panoply of problems that I think the defense would in most cases suffer from if uh, police officers were to testify. And then he sort of goes on and on, but it seems like that is a 403 analysis. 
So it's, it, I mean, I'm, I'm just pointing out the fact that he did not make a finding that this was going to be substantially more prejudicial than probative, which is, I think, what is required under 403. But the um, the point that he's making there is that people could just sort of essentially, people can just come in and say any old thing, and there's going to be no way for juries to know whether they should believe this person or not. And that is very much based on their the court's belief that I think they say in the battle of um, experience, you need expert qualification. I think he says something like that at some point. Um, this may be also in those sealed transcripts that you don't have access to. And if you, if it would be helpful, we can make those accessible to the court. But the court is very much focused and, and says, actually, I think at the very close of this, I am not here faced with a question that was not presented in this case, which, and I'm going off the top of my head here, apologies for any myth paraphrasing, but um, the, the issue that was not presented in this case, which is if this was coming in as an expert testimony, you have only suggested that after this ruling, and I've already made my ruling, and we need to move on with the trial. Um, but there's just throughout this entire discussion with the court, a suggestion that the court believes if this was coming in under an expert, it would not be more prejudicial than probative. It would be relevant. And the problem that the court has is this idea that lay witness opinion testimony, this is not proper lay witness opinion testimony because there's no foundation for jurors to look to, to understand how they should weigh it. And that only comes from qualification as an expert. And we know that that is wrong. It was a misunderstanding of 701. Um, there are and that is because that's sort of underlying all of this language about prejudicial than probative, this court can't give that any weight uh, beyond the fact that this, we, we would argue that this is not even an official finding under 403 because it's the wrong standard. Do you want to say something about your opponent's hearsay point? Uh, the hearsay point? Um, so this is not hearsay, both because it's not being introduced for the truth of the matter asserted. If it, if it were slightly different language, um, such as I believe, um, I don't think I don't think that self defense exists in the district. That would be state of mind evidence, which fall under the exception to the hearsay. Um, it would fall under a hearsay exception. Um, so there's no, I, I don't think there's any universe in which that would be hearsay. Um, so if the court has no further questions, um, we would ask you to reverse on, we re reverse both convictions. Thank you very much, Ms. Williams. And thank you, Mr. Carroll. We appreciate both of your briefing and arguments today. And um, we will take the case under advisement. You can um, now log off. We're just waiting for Mr. Jonas. Ah, Ms. Jonas there. There we go. Um, can everyone hear? Okay. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Yes, Your Honor. The the third case um, on today's uh, calendar is number 21 CV370, uh, Walgreen Company versus Humana Health Plan. Um, Mr. Robinson, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, my name is Frederick Robinson, and I am here today on behalf of the appellant, Walgreen Company. I would like to reserve three minutes of my time for rebuttal, if that's okay. okay. Your honors, there are two undisputed facts in this case that control its outcome. The first is that there is no arbitration agreement between Walgreens and the law firm of Kroll and Mooring. The second undisputed fact is that Kroll and Mooring never sought, let alone received, Walgreens informed consent to arbitrate disputes 
over Kroll's compliance with the rules of professional conduct. Because of these undisputed facts, the Superior Court erred in requiring Walgreens to arbitrate any aspects of its professional liability claims against Kroll and Mooring, including its claims for a preliminary injunction. Robinson, may I ask a couple of threshold questions? Um, so uh, under the Superior Court's order, the question of whether this is arbitrable was to be decided by the arbitrator. Has the arbitrator passed on that question yet? No. That has not been presented to the arbitrator because we disagree with the Superior Court's ruling and we took this appeal instead. But the arbitration itself was still ongoing. You haven't sought to stay the arbitration of other questions. We have not sought to stay the arbitration. The arbitration is still ongoing. And I suppose if your problem is that you think this council should have been disqualified, it seems kind of putting the cart before the horse to allow the merits of the arbitration to go forward without seeking a, a question or an answer from the arbitrator as to whether this separate claim is arbitrable or not. Well, Your, Your Honor, that's one of the reasons why we sought summary reversal in this court, which was denied, but that was one of the reasons why we tried to ex get an expedited decision out of uh, the Court of Appeals. But once it was denied, we still don't believe that the arbitration is the right forum to decide our professional liability claims against Kroll and Mooring because we never agreed to arbitrate anything with the law firm of Kroll and Mooring. And my next threshold question is your lawsuit, the Walgreens versus Kroll and Mooring Superior Court suit, that's still going forward, correct? That's correct. The judge denied a motion to dismiss and the case is now in discovery. And so in that way, aren't you getting what you want, which is to not have to arbitrate the merits of your professional responsibility claims? No, what we wanted, well, ultimately we'll get what we want because we'll prevail and there'll be a permanent injunction entered in against Kroll and Mooring as part of that case. On the other hand, we weren't, we believe we were entitled to seek a preliminary injunction from the Superior Court so that while the lawsuit was pending, Kroll and Mooring would have to stop violating their ethical duties to Walgreens by suing a former client on a substantially related issue. Can I ask you, 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 the way you've stated it thus far, it seems as though you uh, are advocating a flat rule, which is if A and B sign an arbitration agreement and then A goes off and sues C, that A can never be required to arbitrate uh, anything, you know, that lawsuit or anything related to that lawsuit because there's no arbitration agreement between A and C. Is your argument that broad? Do you think the only, that there's just a flat rule, uh, any lawsuit between A and C can't be pushed in whole or in part into arbitration if there is no arbitration agreement between A and C? I don't know that I would necessarily go that far because you could have a situation where a party C was a third party beneficiary of the contract between A and B, which is not the case, or the clause within the, the arbitration agreement might cover disputes involving other parties on its face, which we've seen in some of the cases as well. In this case, though, so another, I was thinking of another set of uh, hypotheticals. Uh, what if um, uh, rather than suing the lawyer uh, on a conflict theory, uh, uh, Walgreens here had filed a suit against a witness, someone who was proposed to be a witness in the arbitration to try to stop that witness from testifying, or uh, had filed a lawsuit against the arbitrator, with whom obviously there's no arbitration agreement, trying to stop the arbitrator from doing one thing or another. Would you say none of that could be per sent into arbitration pursuant to this agreement because that is a lawsuit between Walgreens and someone other than Humana. And therefore, whatever the arbitration agreement may compel, it doesn't compel any arbitration of any such suit because the named party, the named defendant in those other suits is not uh, Humana. I think that you would, there would be an, a very strong argument that those cases could not be subject to arbitration. And I think that we don't have to go that far in this case because obviously those are not the factors that we're dealing with here. But if you look at this court's decision in the Jahanbein case, which I think is, is really controlling here, 
you have to look, I think what Jahan Bain teaches us is that you have to look at who are the parties who've got the dispute? And is there an arbitration? And then you have to look at, is there an arbitration agreement between the two of them? And well, I guess that's where you lose me because the, the, the other way, your, your opponent tries to frame it a different way. And I just want to see where you think your opponent goes off the rails. Mm -hmm. Your opponent's view, and this is, I think, the trial court's view too, is uh, the current uh, uh, issue is uh, Humana trying to compel you to arbitrate something. There is an arbitration agreement between Hugh, you and Humana. So in trying to figure out what you have to arbitrate if Humana is trying to make you arbitrate it, you go to that agreement. And that agreement says the parties agree that any dispute arising out of their business relationship, which they can't you know, decide by mutual agreement, shall be submitted to an arbitrator. And this is the part that your opponent emphasizes and the trial court was persuaded by, including disputes concerning the scope, validity, or applicability of this agreement. And right. so your opponent says, we have an arbitration agreement with Walgreens. Mm -hmm. okay. Our position is, that this question of who the lawyer can be, who our lawyer can be in the arbitral, in the arbitration is a dispute arising out of our business relationship. You may or may not agree with that, uh, Walgreens, but you, what you did agree to is not to have a court decide that question of whether that is an arbitral dispute, but instead to have uh, an arbitrator decide that sort of meta, uh, you know, higher level of traction question, which is, does the scope of your agreement with uh, Humana uh, reach this question of who gets to be Humana's lawyer in the arbitration as against your claims that that lawyer may be you know, uh, uh, in a conflict of interest in violating uh, uh, professional duties and ethical rules? Uh, what, so what's wrong with that line of thinking? Where, where, where does that go off the rails? Okay, it goes off the rails in a couple of ways. And let me give you, let me give you a hypothetical, if I may, that explains that. All right. So just because the relief we're seeking from um, Kroll and Mooring might have an impact on Humana down the road, doesn't mean that this our claim against Kroll and Mooring arises from the business relationship that we have with Humana. You may well be right about that. Okay. Um, but the, and, the, the your opponent's argument is make that argument in front of the arbitrator because you agreed, I mean, that's an issue about the scope of this agreement and you agreed in the agreement to have arbitrators decide disputes about the scope. So the question is not whether this arises out of the business relationship. The question is who decides that and what did you agree to about who would decide that? Right, and let me make, let me make a couple points about that, Your Honor. First of all, in the District of Columbia, because of the District of Columbia ethics rules, a client cannot be forced to arbitrate a dispute about the professional ethics of a member of the bar unless they have given informed consent. Where does that, where, where, uh, you worded it as a client can't be forced to dispute it. Does our ethical rule say that or does our ethical rule say what lawyers can do about uh, bringing uh, those matters to arbitration? Well, no, I, they, I think the ethical rules and plus the ethics opinion- That's true. Is that 306 kind of make it clear that a client cannot be forced to arbitrate without having given informed consent. What wording? And, tell me what word you're what wording you're focused on. What wording I'm focused on? So why do you I'm, say? That? Why do I say it that way? Because the po whole point of that ethical rule is to protect clients. So the the DC the the bar has said that while an eth while an agreement to arbitrate between a lawyer and a client um, can be enforced. It can only be enforced if the client gives informed consent. And the whole point- Again, show, could you tell me, just quote the, rule, the language that you're referring to. Sure. First I'm talking about, there's ethics opinion 376, goes into this in, in length and talking about the uh, effect of the amendments uh, to the rules on um, on prior opinions. And it says, and basically what the rule has said um, is that uh, if you look at the, um, it's, they conclude fee arbitration 
provisions are ordinary fee agreements within the meaning of comment one to rule 1.8. Okay, but they say as an ordinary fee arrangement, the requirements of 1.8 do, do not apply, meaning the client does not need to give, have to be given an opportunity to seek advice from somebody else. However, there still has to be informed consent. And the requirement is that the client be fully informed of the scope and effect of the agreement. And that's in both comment 13 to rule 1.8 as described by DC Bar Ethics Opinion 376. So the whole point of this is to say in the District of Columbia, our public policy is that a client cannot be forced to arbitrate a professional ethics dispute with the client unless they've agreed and given informed consent. So I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Robinson, do you really need to rely on uh, opinion 376? I mean, it seems to me that your argument is simply in all jurisdictions in the US, arbitration is a matter of contract. And since there was no arbitration agreement between Walgreens and Kroll, that this can't be shoehorned into the Humana arbitration. Well, that's the first argument. And then as a, you know, then I agree with you, Judge Ali Khan, that that is our preliminary argument, which I think is based upon this court's ruling in the Jahanbein case, which is consistent with the Supreme Court's ruling in the Henry Schein case. All of these cases say, we don't even get to the issue of what's in scope until we determine that there is actually an arbitration agreement that covers this dispute. And so in Jahanbein, remember the, the two condominium owners had both signed arbitration agreements with their condominium association, but they, the court concluded they hadn't signed them with each other. So, what, so you have to look at what is the particular dispute here. And right here, our dispute is not on this issue with Humana. Our dispute is with Kroll and Mooring and how they switch sides on us and went and started soliciting clients to sue Walgreens on an issue that it had advised, it had advised Walgreens on years before. But wasn't, wasn't Jahan buying more, wasn't the point there that the two uh, separate condo owners issues <laughs> were not related to the main dispute? I don't think that you can say that they were unrelated to the dispute with the condominium association, because what happened is in unit number two. But isn't two, that what the court said? I don't think they were unrelated. I think I don't think the issue was that the disputes were unrelated. I think the court actually looked to see, and your honor was one of the lookers, right? You, you look to see what were the specifics of the arbitration agreements and did the arbitration agreement that they had, that the condo owners had signed actually covered the dispute between the two of them. But the disputes were related. They all dealt with who was gonna pay for the water damage to uh, Mr. John Bond's unit when they, the money, when the water, the pipe broke in unit number two and came down into unit number one. And in fact, there, one of the facts that's alleged in the case is that the condominium association had gotten insurance money to pay Mr. Jahanbein and was holding on to it. So the really, you know, he was trying, Mr. Jahanbein was trying to get the same money from both people. So the cases were clearly related in terms of the relief they were seeking. And if I can get back to what I was going to say to uh, Judge McLeese, here's a, let me give you this hypothetical and see what you think of this. Let's say that the government, the federal government passed a law that said, Humana can pay us a pharmacy like Walgreens less money when it's serving Medicare patients, okay? And Walgreens thinks that that law is illegal, that it was violated, that it was issued in violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. So Walgreens goes to federal court and files a lawsuit to enjoin that law. And if Walgreens wins, Humana will have to start paying it more money. Nobody would say that that case was subject to the arbitration clause in the Walgreens Humana contract. Well, I was thinking of worse hypotheticals than that, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I, um, I tend to think that someone might say that and might say, 
if uh, Walgreens doesn't like that consequence, maybe it shouldn't sign arbitration agreements, which say that any dispute about the scope of the agreement is going to be decided by an arbitrator. Um, so, I mean, you know, it seems to me that if you sign an agreement which says we're going to agree to arbitrate X and X is, you know, things arising out of our business relationship or whatever it might be. Right. And it doesn't say uh, like disputes between the two of us only. It doesn't limit who the parties to those disputes would be by its terms. Um, and it does, you know, the terms are maybe subject to reasonable debate. Uh, you know, what is what arises out of a business relationship? Who knows? Um, now, ordinarily, the question of whether the arbitration that arbitration agreement compels arbitration would be for a court to decide. I think, you know, at least presumptively in a lot of jurisdictions. But the parties are allowed to uh, provide otherwise. And if they sign an agreement which says, by the way, if you and I, the two parties to this arbitration agreement, ever have a dispute about what it applies to, an arbitrator will decide that. And that could be, you know, it could be just, you know, it could have been that, uh, you know, if Humana got into, uh, I mean, if Walgreens got into a lawsuit that was entirely unrelated to anything that uh, Humana could even plausibly argue had anything to do with their business relationship. Right. Um, and then for whatever irrational reason, or maybe rational reason, Humana came in and tried to stick its nose into that litigation as a non-party and said, well, guess what? We have the signed agreement with Walgreens. And Walgreens said that if we ever got to a dispute with mm -hmm. Walgreens about this agreement that we've signed and what it compels by way of arbitration, an arbitrator would decide that. Right. We're claiming maybe completely implausibly, that this is covered by that arbitration agreement's language about disputes arising out of business relationship. Um, you know, one way of looking at it and looking at the Supreme Court's uh, case law in this general area is, you, you know, uh, Walgreens agreed in very un unambiguous language that uh, any uh, dispute concerning the scope of this agreement that, that Humana is waiving is for an arbitrator. Right. Um, and so no matter how ridiculous the hypothetical and, so, you know, uh, uh, it may be that that's the consequence of the agreement you signed. Why, why can you explain to me as a matter of contract law, why that isn't the plain language of your agreement? Well, uh, there's OK, there's other language that we have to look at in the agreement. So if you look at joint appendix pages 17 and 18, there are two other provisions in this contract that are very important. One is section 12.2 in the arbitration. Well, that's what I was quoting. That's what I was right? quoting. Well, 12.2 also says that claims regarding general professional liability are outside the scope of this agreement. Then you get to 12.4, which says that an arbitration under this agreement can only be between Walgreens and Humana. Here, we're suing Kroll and Mooring. I think part of the problem with the Superior Court's decision is it's based on a fiction that Walgreens claims what, in this case are against is, Humana. Two points, I want to make sure I understand each of them. So your first of them is uh, an argument about an exclusion, any dispute relating to professional liability. Right. Um, is that a point that has previously been raised in this litigation? Because I have to confess I hadn't focused on it. Is that in your brief? Yes, it's in our brief. Uh, can you uh, maybe I, on something you point me to where you argue that that exclusion uh, uh, yeah, is germane here. Although again, the, the difficulty is uh, whether this is a dispute relating to professional or general liability or not is itself arguably a question about the scope of the agreement, which, you know, there's a lot, there's a sentence that just says, if there's a dispute about the scope of this agreement, you and uh, Humana have agreed an arbitrator will decide it. Can you tell me, do you, not, do you think that the disputes we're talking about today are not disputes about the scope of this agreement? No, because the, the scope of the agreement is related, as you can see from 12.4, which is the next provision I've just cited to you. It says that an arbitration under this agreement can only be between Walgreens and Humana. Right, and, and Humana is trying to compel an arbitration between an arbitrator to decide what it is viewing as a dispute between you and it. And I understand you not unreasonably think that it's a dispute not limited to you and Humana, and it, it is importantly between you and Crowell and Mooring. Right. Um, but they, nobody's trying to force you into an arbitration with Crowell and, uh, with Crowell and Mooring as, Wait, as an arbitrator to the arbitration, are they? Well, yes, the judge, the Superior Court judge did that because 
we said we want a preliminary injunction against Kroll and Mooring so that they can't do anything that's adverse to Walgreens. Not just, we didn't limit it. We didn't say, please tell them to stop appearing in the arbitration. We don't want them advising Humana adversely to us, working behind the scenes, doing soliciting new clients to sue Walgreens. And the, and the Superior Court stayed all of that because of this motion. And none of these other things that we're seeking are, are in any way conceivably subject to the arbitration clause. So, Mr. So Robinson, on that yes. score, at least in the Superior Court proceedings, you indicated that you thought there were other cases out there, other representations that Kroll was engaging in with um, companies like Humana, and you wanted the Superior Court to put a stop to that as well. I didn't see that in your appellate briefing. So is your claim wider than just this Humana representation? Our preliminary injunction motion at the, at the Superior Court was not limited to the Humana arbitration proceeding. We wanted a broader injunction against Kroll and Mooring violating their ethical duties to Walgreens, however we could prove that they were doing it. So we, we were prepared at the preliminary injunction hearing, certainly to prove that they were violating, that they had an ethical violation with respect to their representation of Humana. But we had, you know, our case, the claims in our case are basically are generally to get Kroll and Mooring to stop violating its ethical duties. Is it is it true as a matter of, of fact that what you say on JA 102 about Kroll representing other payers in suits against Walgreens, is that is that actually, are there other suits out there? Yes, there are. Can I ask you, I'm puzzled about this, and I also got very interested in this, these topics, but am I right that this is an appeal from the order to compel arbitration, not an appeal in your lawsuit against Crow and Moore? Well, we also appealed, I believe we appealed both the order compelling us to arbitrate, which was also combined with the order that stayed our motion for preliminary injunction. I have to go, uh, but focus for a minute on the order to compel arbitration. Right. The order to compel arbitration is narrow, is more narrowly tailored to compel you to arbitrate your request that Crowell and Warren be joined from representing Humana in the arbitration. So that's not, it doesn't uh, really address whatever claims you might have or effort you might have to stop Crowell and Warren from doing other things. The, the order to compel arbitration seems limited solely to who gets to be the lawyer in the arbitration. Is that correct or am I missing something? The order to compel arbitration may have been limited in that way, but and our I, motion for sure, preliminary yeah. injunction was stayed at the same time. Right, I know. And, and, and were you saying a minute ago, because I'm not sure I uh, understood this to be the case, that you think you filed a separate notice of appeal trying to bring before us the question of the correctness of the scope of the trial court's orders in connection with your preliminary injunction request in the lawsuit against Crow and Mooring? Because that would be funny, because if that's true, then Crow and Mooring definitely should be a party to this uh, uh, to these proceedings, and it isn't. I'm just checking my history here, Your Honor, to make sure that I have this right. I believe the motion to compel arbitration was in the case filed by Humana. But, right. But I think at the same time, there was the order, This our motion for preliminary injunction was stayed at the same time. That's certainly true, but I thought you were saying that both of those orders were before us on appeal. And I thought the only thing that was before us on appeal was the order compelling arbitration. That may be, Your Honor. That may be because that may have been the only the, the appeal of the appealable order was the the motion to compel arbitration. And the reason I ask those questions is to the extent it might be argued that the judge stayed more than the judge ought to have uh, in the lawsuit between you and Crow and Mooring. It seems like if you wanted to get that issue uh, in front of us, 
the way to do that would have been by way of challenging that. Uh, and I have to think through the uh, interlocutory appealability and in order right. to junctions and all that. But assuming that, that uh, as I tend to think that is, would have been an appealable order, um, uh, the way to get that in front of us might have been that. Whereas the order to compel arbitration is tied to who gets to be the lawyer for Crowell and Mooring in the arbitration. And one, one thing about that, this kind of wraps back around some of these topics that I asked in these hypotheticals at the beginning, but uh, it does seem potentially quite disruptive to arbitration if a party to an arbitration agreement can not be required to have that issue, like who's going to be the lawyer for the other side in the arbitration, be decided by an arbitrator, but instead is something that you go to court about. And it seems like it would be equally disruptive back to these hypotheticals. If I uh, sign an arbitration agreement and then we get an arbitrator and we gear up and then I sue in court and I don't name my, the, the, the other party to the arbitration agreement, but I name a witness that the party's trying to call or I name the arbitrator himself or herself and you know, bring a lawsuit to try to interfere or interfere as a, uh, to try to get a judge to intervene in the way the arbitration is being conducted about who the lawyer is or what decisions the arbitrator is making or who the, you know, what discovery the arbitrator is ordering or which, uh, which witnesses will be called, uh, all of that. If, if all of that is just open season uh, in court, notwithstanding an arbitration agreement, because none of the named defendants in those hypothetical actions are parties to the agreement, that seems like a, a nice big highway uh, to get around uh, uh, arbitration and also maybe to delay arbitration. And, you know, it's claimed advantage is that it's uh, a speedier, streamlined way of uh, dispute resolution. So, well, I think, Your Honor, in some ways you have to look at it from the perspective of our lawsuit against Kroll and Mooring. So we have filed a lawsuit against Kroll and Mooring because of their side switching against Walgreens. We're seeking money damages. We're seeking various types of equitable relief. We're seeking permanent injunctive relief at the end of the case as well. And the only and so the only thing that's being split off right now is this request for a preliminary injunction because a small piece of it relates to this other arbitration. So when you talk about splitting things up, it's our lawsuit that's being carved up when, we, when we're trying to get relief, complete relief against Kroll and Mooring, and who we do not have an arbitration agreement with. And this, this argument and what you're compositing here, it actually came up in one of the cases we cited in our brief. That's the Dean Witter Reynolds case from the Southern District of Texas. And while that's not a binding precedent on this court, in that case, a lawyer switched sides on a brokerage firm. Right. They used to represent the brokerage firm, and then they decided to sue the brokerage firm in arbitrations. And the brokerage firm went to federal court to get an order disqualifying the law firm from proceeding in the arbitration. And the law firm there made the same arguments that, that Humana and Kroll and Mooring are, have been making in this case. They're making the argument that Oh, well, this is all subsumed. This is all part of the arbitration. It's all subsumed in the arbitration and the arbitration agreement covers this as well. And the federal judge said, no, there is no agreement requiring um, the client, the, the, cl the former client to arbitrate ethical disputes with the law firm. And that's what exactly what we have here. So this, this, this issue has come up before a court, at least one court has looked at it and said, no, this doesn't interfere with arbitration because remember, and I think this is something that the Supreme Court just emphasized a couple of weeks ago in the Morgan versus Sundance Inc. case, the federal policy is not to favor arbitration no matter what. We can't make up rules of contract interpretation so that we get to the result of more arbitration. We have to be, our contract interpretation rules have to be neutral. And here in this case, if you follow the precedent from Jahan Bain and you look at, all right, what's the dispute here? The dispute here is the dispute between Kroll and Mooring and Walgreens. There is no arbitration contract covering that dispute between those parties. 
the fact that there's an un, there is a somewhat related arbitration agreement involving somebody else, just like in Jahanbein, there was an, the the condo owners had signed an arbitration agreement Mr. Robinson, with somebody else. That you, wasn't enough. Do you agree that if you had wanted to just seek disqualification of parole um, representing Humana, you could have filed a motion for disqualification in the arbitral proceedings? Uh, we we could have done that possibly, although there is a dispute. You know, there is a, a split of cases about whether arbitrators have the authority. Uh, to uh, provide that kind of relief, and some courts think that they don't. But nothing so, in our court, right? Not, not in your, not in this court. That's correct. But again, and if this simply is so an order saying you need to get out of this case would not have met the goals that we wanted when we filed. I, the I take that to be, uh, yeah, I, I find some merit in that. But I suppose why not the belt and suspenders? If it's so odious to you to have Humana being represented by Kroll because of your prior engagement with them. Why not seek to get them out of this arbitration instead of letting this arbitration go on on the merits? Um, well, kind of also trying to seek broader relief in Superior Court. Well, one, Your Honor, I think that we wanted to get something precedential, and I don't believe that the um, order from our arbitrator would necessarily be viewed by other courts around the country as precedential. Secondly, quite frankly, because the arbitrator was was continuing to review the merits of the case, we were concerned that if we put all the evidence in about Kroll's ethical misconduct in an effort to prejudice the arbitrator, it might actually give, uh, excuse me, uh, we might actually give Humana an enforcement defense at the end of the day, that they had been, their choice of counsel had been unduly prejudiced. Therefore, what we were trying to do in fairness, actually, was to shield the arbitrator from all the evidence about the terrible misconduct that Kroll had engaged in, so that his he could look at the case on the merits and not be prejudiced by knowing what had really happened here. So I, I don't know, maybe Judge McLeese has a, a view on this, but um, it seems like if you were to have brought bar proceedings against the Kroll Council, and as a result, this court had ordered them suspended or disbarred. That is a question that would affect, obviously, Humana's arbitration and their ability to have Kroll as their counsel, but not a matter that could have been brought into the arbitration because, you know, disbarment and suspension are squarely within our purview. Um, and if that's the case, I guess, why did you not try and seek bar discipline if you think this is such an egregious ethical violation? Well, we may still try to seek bar discipline, Your Honor, but I think in the meantime, we felt that the way to send a message was to bring a lawsuit for money damages and other forms of equitable relief to really make them think twice about what they've done here again. Because remember, what happened in this case is that, you know, after, when we first brought this to their attention, you know, Kroll's response was to deny that they'd ever represented Walgreens and to refuse to give us our legal files. And only once we pushed back and they gave us the files and we saw, you know, how egregious the violations had been, did, did we file, we decide that we need, to, we need to make a statement here and we need to file a lawsuit. And we thought that the lawsuit would get us more effective and more expeditious relief than filing a bar complaint, but I wouldn't rule out- It clearly didn't, it. right? I mean, here we are, what, two and a half years later, and we're just thinking about this. And so I guess, I don't know, why did you not sort of take some kind of like mitigation measures, right? At this point, it seems like were we to agree with you, you're throwing out two and a half years of arbitration. I have no doubt your companies have spent a lot of money on. We understand that, Your Honor, but we felt that this was the right way to, that this was the right way to proceed um, we uh, the case is moving. You know, COVID obviously has slowed down all litigation, but the case in the Superior Court is moving through discovery. We feel that we have assembled an incredible amount of good evidence in support of our case, which we might not have been able to do otherwise. So we feel that we have uh, benefited from bringing the lawsuit and and really getting uh, key discovery that's going to help us prove our case at the end of the day. And I guess that gets back to one of my earlier questions, which is. Why not then have the arbitrator decide this question of whether this is arbitrable or not? Because he could very easily, or she, I don't know the gender of your arbitrator, um, you know, could say 
this is not a question that's arbitrable, and then your or your superior court proceedings could continue apace. Right, but then our our uh, our appeal would have been moot, and we felt it was important to get this issue in front of the court of appeals, because let me give you another hypothetical to explain why we think this is so important. Let's assume that Kroll and Mooring had actually come to Walgreens and said. We want you to enter into a engagement letter with us that includes an arbitration clause. And Walgreens had said no. Under the Superior Court's ruling, that's irrelevant. So even if the client had said, I am not going to agree to arbitrate with you, Kroll and Mooring, about your ethical violations, under the Superior Court's ruling, it doesn't matter. We can still be, or the fact that we withheld consent doesn't matter. We can still be forced to arbitrate what is basically an ethical complaint in a form we didn't agree to. Well, you're not, I, well, I guess that gets me very puzzled. What you are forced to arbitrate is whether Crow and Mooring can remain as the arbitrator, as the uh, lawyer for your opponent in the arbitration. It's but a that is. It, it's a little murky to me whether the arbitrator, uh, you point out that there's some uncertainty about whether arbitrators can decide those questions. There's also uncertainty about if so, how, what rules they apply and whether they are governed by the ethical rules that are you know, stated in, in the rules of professional conduct. Mm -hmm. All that's uncertain. And in any event, none of it is, I don't think anybody's suggesting that however the arbitrator, whether the arbitrator at the end of that says, yep, Crowell can stay in or nope, Crowell is out. Nobody thinks that it's going to bind you or Crowell uh, and Mooring in any future dispute you might have about whether their conduct was ethical or it wouldn't bar, you know, it wouldn't uh, bind bar disciplinary authorities. So it, it, it may or may not have uh, the, the termination of, of removal or disqualification of Crowell and Mooring may or may not have some ethical content to it. It may involve the arbitrator or may not involve the arbitrator reaching conclusions about whether Crowell and Mooring's conduct was a violation of the rules of professional conduct. Um, but if it does, which again, it may or may not, uh, it won't bind anybody. So in what sense are you then compelled to arbitrate your dispute with Crowell and Mooring if whatever the arbitrator does, you're free to continue with your litigation eventually against Crowell and Mooring, unbound by whatever the arbitrator chooses to, chooses to do under whatever legal principles the arbitrator chooses to apply because the issue that the if, if the arbitrator is is considering the issue of disqualification it's all about whether or not there was an ethical violation by Kroll and Mori. you can't that's not an issue that's going to be decided in a vacuum the star of the proceedings is going to be Kroll and Mori and what they did and whether it complied with the ethical rules and we believe we never agreed to arbitrate a, a dispute about the ethics of our former counsel in any in any forum other than a judicial forum. And we're being forced. But the problem is the opponent says that you signed an agreement that says, I will arbitrate disputes with you, Humana. And if anybody has, you know, if we have a disagreement about what disputes are, we've agreed to arbitrate, I'll arbitrate that with you. And so you yeah, did. Meta. But it's disputes with you. It's well, disputes that, where, with you and nobody else. Where is that? And it, says, it says you and nobody else. Where is that in the arbitration agreement? In 12.4, it says that it, it arbitrated a dispute, an arbitration involved, under this agreement in 12.4 can only be between Walgreens and Humana. As is what they, and that's what they're trying to compel is an arbitration between the two of you that does for sure implicate uh, your claims uh, uh, against third parties. But, yeah, but, it's, it, but it has to be arising from the agreement. So what they're doing is they're basically okay. saying any place we want to claim an interest, we uh, can force you to counsel, arbitrate. Counsel, counsel, excuse me. I'm sorry, Your Honor. You, 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 part of the difficulty I have in this case is that uh, a lot of times you uh, shift the discussion to whether this arises out of your agreement. And the problem for me is that the mm -hmm. trial didn't decide that question and didn't think it should. Right. And instead said the real issue 
is whether this is a dispute about the scope of your arbitral agreement with uh, uh, Humana. And so that's, for me, I, I, to, it looks to me as though this agreement says that you agree to have an arbitrator to decide what kinds of, you know, any dispute about the scope of your arbitral agreement that you sign with Humana. So to me, an argument about whether this does or doesn't arise uh, out of the business agreement won't uh, be effective unless you can first persuade me or explain to me why this is not a dispute about the scope of your arbitral agreement with uh, uh, Humana. So that's where right. I get it. Okay, because there's a, you can, the, this, the arbitral agreement is, has to relate to disputes between Walgreens and Humana, not between Walgreens and somebody else. So let's say somebody walked into a Walgreens store and pulled out a gun and started shooting up everything there. And it turns out that they were Humana insured, okay? And Walgreens brought a law, wanted to sue them for property damage. And Humana says, well, you know what? We think that falls under the scope of our agreement because the person who did the property damage in your, in your drugstore happened to be there to fill a prescription. So we think if it wasn't for him filling the prescription that we, would, we were ensuring that uh, this would never have happened. And therefore this has to be brought under an, our, our arbitration agreement. I mean, and that my, argument goes too far. No, I, I actually think it may not. Uh, it may be that what would happen then is that they would file a motion to compel, compel arbitration. The judge would look at it and say, well, that does seem to be a dispute about the scope of this agreement. It's not a very reasonable argument, but I'm going to send that off to arbitration. Arbitration will look at the agreement and very quickly realize this has nothing to do with the scope of the, this has nothing to do with the, uh, it doesn't arise out of the business relationship and therefore it's not arbitrable and send you right back to court quickly. And if you don't like, you know, that sequence of events, then one could say, don't sign agreements that say, I will, I agree to have an arbitrator decide any dispute about the scope of the agreement I'm signing with you. Right. But I think what I agreed to is to have an arbitrator decide the scope of a, of an, of, of a, the scope of a dispute between myself and Humana, between Walgreens and Humana. I didn't agree to allow Humana to have this roving interest to make me go to an arbitrator every time they don't like it that I've sued somebody else. And that's what's going on here. And I shouldn't have to take this, and arbitration, quite frankly, isn't that fast. So I don't think I'm gonna get in there and get out within a month. I mean, you gotta get, you gotta get you, your filings, you gotta have your answer, you have to pick your arbitrator. There's all sorts of administrative things that go on here that slow down arbitrations. Okay, Mr. And, Robinson, I think we take your point and we've given you lots of time and kept you up here for a while. So let's hear from Ms. Jonas. Thank you. And we will give you some time for a rebuttal. Uh, may it please the court, Casey Trombley Shapiro Jonas on behalf of Appleese. Despite Walgreens efforts, Mr. Robinson's efforts to present this case otherwise, there are two issues that dictate, that are very simple and dictate the end result as a superior court found. First, as your honors have been pointing out, the parties here and the parties ordered to arbitrate are Humana and Walgreens. Kroll and Mooring is not a party to this appeal, is not a party to the arbitration, would not be arbitrating with Walgreens. Humana would be. Second, Isn't the entire scope of the arbitration of this question going to be about Kroll's actions vis-a-vis -vis Walgreens, which have nothing to do with Humana? Likely, yes, Your Honor. Uh, yes, Your Honor. How it, but that doesn't affect the result of this appeal. It does not matter what the underlying issues are that need to be resolved. The question is whether Humana and Walgreens have an arbitration agreement and whether that arbitration agreement commits to the arbitrator questions of arbitrability, i.e. whether the arbitration agreement covers the particular dispute. But in addition, the issue that is, was ordered to be arbitrated is not Walgreens claims against Kroll and Mooring, not breach of fiduciary duty, not unjust enrichment, breach of contract or replevin, the four claims that they've raised in the superior court action that is not before this court, uh, and that is ongoing, is in discovery. Uh, so that, that, is, that is it, that, that dictates the end of this case. 
And well, I, I guess here's my big concern. So let's say they litigate that case, it's past discovery, um, and ultimately the court holds, yes, this is a breach of fiduciary duty. They must cease, you know, all representation of, you know, that's sort of against Walgreens. What does that do then for the arbitration? Does it moot out that question in the arbitration or does the arbitrator get to perhaps come to a completely different conclusion that would be good for one case only? No, Your Honor, depending on timing, certainly what preclusive effect the Superior Court's decision would have uh, on the merits of the case may or may not affect the arbitration. So as Your Honor asked at the beginning of this argument, uh, the arbitration is not just ongoing. The liability phase is over. That has already been decided. The arbitrator has already issued an interim award. The damages phase is scheduled to begin in August. So almost certainly by the time, I mean, it, certainly by the time the Superior Court issues a ruling on the merits or the merits are decided in the Superior Court action, the arbitration will be done and over. So there will be no need to enjoin Kroll from representing Humana in that arbitration. Perhaps, you know, if there's petitions to enforce or vacate, there may be issues there. Um, and additionally, for, if Walgreens were to succeed on the merits, which it is Humana's position that they won't, again, these are still just allegations at this point, uh, but if they were to succeed on the merits, there's other relief they're seeking. There's damages, uh, there's disgorgement of, uh, I believe, fees, or there, there, there's, there's additional relief that Walgreens would be entitled to pursue. Can I ask you how far you go? Because you said you, you know, like two simple propositions and you're done. And if those are true, it does seem like there's some pretty uh, interesting hypotheticals. Uh, so, uh, uh, for example, in this case, uh, uh, Humana did not try to compel arbitration uh, of all of the claims that um, Walgreens was bringing against uh, Crowell and Warren. It tried to peel off, you know, a piece of it that was more entangled with the arbitration. Um, but imagine that uh, Humana had, for tactical or other reasons, been more ambitious, and it had said to the judge, uh, in it had filed a motion to compel arbitration and said, "Take the entire dispute between Walgreens and Humana. All of it needs to go to arbitration, judge." If I understand your position. The answer is the judge would have been required to compel arbitration of not really that whole dispute, but the question of whether that dispute uh, arises out of your business relationship uh, with Humana. Is that true? So that the, if you had asked for it, the trial court on your view would have been required to compel arbitration of the entire uh, action between, um, uh, again, it's imprecise to say compel arbitration of that dispute to compel arbitration, to, to have an arbitrator decide the question of whether that lawsuit could go forward in court or had to be handled by an arbitrator. Is that true? Yes, Your Honor, that is completely true. And even the more absurd hypotheticals that you were discussing with Mr. Robinson while he was arguing, also true. The Sup United States Supreme Court has been perfectly clear that under the Federal Arbitration Act, which governs the arbitration agreement between Humana and Walgreens, there is no, quote, wholly groundless exception to arbitrability questions that have been committed to arbitrator to the arbitrator being decided by the court. So even if Mr. Robinson were completely correct in all of the ways that he is presenting this dispute, and even in the hypothetical your honor just uh, proposed, if Humana had sought to compel arbitration of all of the claims that Walgreens has raised against Kroll and Mooring, even if completely frivolous or wholly groundless, the court would be without authority to decide the arbitrability question because Walgreens and Humana entered into that uh, arbitration agreement. And there's no question that it's valid and that it applies to Humana and Walgreens and that it commits arbitrability questions to the arbitrator. I mean, only if the parties have agreed to arbitrate, right? And so what happens if Mr. Robinson is very upset by all of this? So he moves to disbar all of the lawyers that are involved in this arbitration. That's something that typically comes up through disciplinary counsel and then we rule on. Are you saying that would have to go to arbitration? No, or to right. the question that, of arbitrability? There, there, there are certain questions that are arbitrators are not authorized to decide, such as attorney discipline. So, which frankly, neither is the DC Superior Court. 
But, but so, under your view, it's it's not that they'd be arbitrating that question. It would be that we'd have to send it to arbitration for the arbitrator to say, hey, I can't arbitrate this and then kick it back to us. Right. That seems to be there always has to be this way station. And so I don't know why that wouldn't be your answer to, to my question. Your Honor, it. Frankly, it, 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 I think the court does not need to explore in this case, in this appeal, the far reaches and exactly the limits of the Henry Schein decision of the Supreme Court. So it may be that your honor is correct. And if there were such a situation in which a party to an arbitration agreement sought to send to arbitration a question that demo, like they cannot do under case law, under, under precedent, it may be that that would still have to go to the arbitrator first. That is certainly how I read Henry Schein. But the court need not decide that question here because there's no, there's really no issue here that this is a frivolous arbitration that Humana is seeking. Well, but I think we do have to sort of decide where do we draw the lines. So uh, a Humana employee slips on a banana peel in a Walgreens and cracks their head open. Can Walgreens send that, the question of whether that has to be arbitrated to the arbitrator? Under the court's decision, the Supreme Court's decision in Henry Schein, yes, Your Honor. And that's symmetrical. So you've signed off uh, anything, any dispute that uh, whoever you're naming, whoever your client names as a defendant or whatever else, if uh, Humana takes it uh, into its mind to say, you know, I think we have an agreement, we have an arbitration agreement with Walgreens, and it's got this, you know, extremely broad language about, uh, who's going to decide issues about what it means. And so, you know, from now on, in every lawsuit that, you, that, that uh, Humana files, Walgreens is going to say, well, you know what, uh, A, our positions are A, uh, this is subject, this arises out of our business relationship, and B, uh, judge in whatever court it is, you know, you might think that's laughable, but uh, look at this agreement that uh, uh, Humana, uh, uh, Humana signed with us, so some arbitrator is going to have to figure that out before you can laugh it out of court that you've signed up for that too. It's symmetrical, right? Yes, Your Honor. Precisely. You ask me why? It seems like, I guess if you trust your opponent not to make silly arguments, uh, and maybe if you trust that arbitrators would bounce them out quickly enough, it's not as odd as it seems, but it seems pretty, uh, if that's how these provisions are read, it seems like it's not that prudent to sign on to ones that are worded that broadly and that some more narrow agreement about what kinds of arbitrability disputes will be for arbitrators always uh, might be more in people's uh, sensible interest. But that, that certainly may be the case, Your Honor, but that's not what Walgreens and Humana agreed to here. And as the Supreme Court has made clear, even incredibly recently, and as cited by Mr. Robinson in his uh, letter uh, noticing supplemental authority, Arbitration is a matter of contract. And here we have the contract, which is very broad and commits to arbitration questions of arbitrability. And the Supreme Court has been very clear that even frivolous or wholly groundless exceptions in the court's view wouldn't still not authorize the court to decide whether those disputes are subject to arbitration. But the but, initial suit that was here was Walgreens versus Kroll. And we all agree there was no contract to arbitrate that. But somehow the Superior Court, by virtue of this freestanding lawsuit you brought, carved out a portion of that suit and sent it to arbitration in the absence of an arbitration agreement between Walgreens and Kroll. Yes, Your Honor, because of the arbitration agreement between Humana and Walgreens and because Humana moved to compel arbitration. So again, it's just seems baffling are... to me that you could lasso in these third parties by virtue of saying, well, we have this arbitration agreement, and so suddenly the world is your oyster of putting things into arbitration. I, I, I'd say this, the Supreme Court has been very clear, but perhaps to make the court feel less concerned about the far reaches of what that, what, what the Henry Schein case could mean, that's simply not the situation here. We don't have some, you know, this is not a slip and fall case that Humana has sought to intervene in. This is a case in which Walgreens, for strategic reasons, decided to seek preliminary injunctive relief only in a jurisdiction that had nothing to do with the ongoing and underlying arbitration between Humana and Walgreens, and specifically sought to exclude Humana 
from having any participation or say whatsoever in what happens to its choice of counsel. So Mr. Robinson, for example, raised that it, the, the purpose of the rules of professional conduct, uh, the purpose of attorney ethics are to protect clients. And we must not lose sight of the fact that Humana is Kroll and Mooring's client here. And an innocent client, whether even if the allegations that Walgreens has raised against Kroll and Mooring, which in our position is that they are false, but that is in ongoing uh, discovery in Superior Court. But even if those are correct, Humana had nothing to do with Kroll and Mooring's actions. So Humana is proceeding about a year and a half into arbitration. Recall that the demand for arbitration was served on August in, in August of 2019. Yet Walgreens sought preliminary injunction, injunctive relief, again, without naming Humana as a party, then opposing Humana's uh, effort to intervene in that case to protect its interests. Walgreens then in April 2021, just about two months before the trial and the arbitration was set to proceed, sought to disqualify Humana's counsel in the arbitration. And to be clear, the order that is just going back to some questions that were raised to Mr. Robinson, the order before this court and on appeal is exclusively the court's order uh, compelling arbitration of held to arbitrate its request that Kroll and Mooring be enjoined from representing Humana in the ongoing arbitration between Humana and Walgreens. To the extent Mr. Walgreens sought additional relief as part of the preliminary injunction motion, which is certainly questionable because if you look at that motion, it is entirely based on Walgreens, or excuse me, Kroll and Mooring's representation of Humana in the arbitration. But to the extent there was more relief that they sought or that the court's stay was too broad, that was for Walgreens to raise to the superior court. That has nothing to do with this appeal. It's not before you. Uh, the only thing that is before this court is the order compelling arbitration of Walgreens' effort to disqualify Kroll and specifically whether that it is subject to arbitration. So I, I'm, I, I take the concern that Judge Alicon raised about uh, the approach that you're advocating uh, raising concerns about uh, third parties being kind of dragged into arbitration against their will and without their agreement. And that kind of uh, got me wondering about whether there is a lasso around Crow and Mooring or whether Crow and Mooring is happy to be where it is, or um, is it, uh, as far as I could tell, there's no indication on the record materials that I saw that express that Crow and Mooring has any objection to what the uh, Superior Court did by way of compelling arbitration. No, um, or, or, uh, is that right? That is so my understanding as well. But, so if, if there's a lasso around them, at least they haven't been complaining about it explicitly in the record here. Certainly, Your Honor. And I, 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 another, I, had another I question suppose about if, oh, go if ahead. I go could ahead. interject, even if they were objecting, even if they wanted to be in court, under your view, that wouldn't matter, correct? I mean, Humana could drag them in kicking and screaming if they just on the basis of this arbitration agreement? Well, no, Your Honor, in the sense that Humana could not compel or seek to compel Kroll and Mooring to participate in arbitration. To the extent Kroll and Mooring, in a hypothetical, did not want a disqualification motion raised in the uh, arbitration between Humana and Walgreens, uh, I mean, one, Kroll and Mooring represents Humana in that arbitration and so would have to deal with its client uh, <laughs> directing it to uh, proceed, uh, but it certainly would not be a party to that arbitration. So my like banana peel hypothetical, right? So Walgreens forces the Humana employee with a broken leg into arbitration. And this person says, no, like I want my, my payday in superior court. But I think your view is still that the arbitrator has to decide whether the slip and fall is arbitrable under the arbitration clause. Again, the, the slip and fall, the, the facts would still have to be limited to where Humana is, has a claim of, or a, a claim to arbitrate or a way to seek arbitration against Walgreens or not, I mean, if it were a Walgreens employee, perhaps there might be something there, um, but it would still have to be between Humana and Walgreens. Those are the parties to the arbitration agreement. Well, I'm, I'm not sure, I, I, I hadn't quite fully appreciated uh, Judge Alicant's hypothetical and, and, and your answer to it. So let me just make sure I, I understand it. So imagine that, um, I mean, just a stranger uh, goes into a, a Walgreens store and falls and uh, then brings a tort action against Walgreens. And imagine that Humana somehow tried to intervene in that action and said, 
you know, uh, uh, Walgreens signed an arbitration agreement with us. And our claim is that this is a dispute arising out of our business relationship, which could be a laughable claim on that example. Um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, our view is that this dispute is within the scope of our arbitral agreement. So that action not brought by Walgreen, but instead brought against Walgreen by a third party has to go to an arbitrator, at least to the degree that an arbitrator will have to laugh it out of arbitration and send it back to court. Are you saying, are you going that far? Because I, I, I hadn't, if that was Judge Ali Khan's uh, hypothetical, it's a better one than I had thought of. And it's, uh, uh, that does seem more disturbing when the action is being brought by a third party who is then, whose dispute is being taken to, to uh, delayed. Uh, I mean, it's one thing if Walgreen, which signed this agreement, gets hung up in a dispute about its scope in front of an arbitrator if the agreement by its term says that's where it ends up. It's another thing that some third party would be delayed in litigating its claims against Walgreen because Walgreen signed a dispute with Humana that Humana is trying to, let's say on the hypothetical, you know, completely unjustifiably use for no obvious reason in the hypothetical. Um, are, are you, but you go that far. You think in a hypothetical where it is a complaint against uh, uh, Walgreens uh, by a third party uh, in tort, for example, obviously unrelated to anything between Walgreens and Humana, you think that an arbitrator would have to decide, would have to reach those conclusions rather than a court being able to? I, I think not, Your Honor, because again, the claims there would be the third party against Walgreens. So I'm struggling to conceive of the scenario in which Humana, there still has to be. So the court, the, the precedent, the precedent question that always is decided by the court and not the arbitrator is whether a valid arbitration agreement exists between the parties. Well, but so it, it, there me, a, a recurring confusion in this case is when people say the parties, it's a little unclear who they mean. Do they mean the parties to the arbitration agreement or to the parties to whatever lawsuit people are discussing? And so I'm not sure which you mean in the sentence you were uttering. So I sorry to interrupt, but I, no, I under, find... understanding your confusion, your honor, that is fair and, and well taken. Uh, and, and certainly has been used in the party's briefs. And we disagree on who the relevant parties are, so fair. Uh, but the, the, the reason I raise it is because it is, I'm having trouble in that hypothetical understanding how Humana would have a claim against Walgreens, which is what would be required. It, it would, it's it not wouldn't. that they have to have a claim though, right? It's that they can say, we think this relates to our agreement with Walgreens. And then that, always means 100% of the time it kicks to an arbitrator. Not, not necessarily if, again, there is, so I think that's- You said yourself that. that there's no like sort of frivolous exception here. So if Walgreens or Humana wanted to be a pain on the other side, anytime there was any suit that was v Walgreens, Humana could say, I think this relates to our business relationship. And every single time send it to an arbitrator to say, no, it doesn't, this is dumb, go back to court. It still has to be a dispute between Humana and Walgreens. So I don't know that there would be a scenario in which, um, and again, I do, I, I will answer the question, but want to reiterate that the court need not in this scenario go to the far ends of what the Henry Schein decision requires in all of arbitration. Uh, but because that's simply not what's occurring here. Uh, but in that scenario, I could see, even if that were the case, and the court found that human there was no frivolous exception, there's no holy groundless exception, and so Humana were entitled to arbitrate claims against Walgreens. I don't know that that necessarily means that this court would not be able to proceed with the litigation between the third party who has nothing to do with Humana and Walgreens and Walgreens. So again, this is kind of a difficult hypothetical because- And then what do you have? So, so let's like say a less ridiculous hypothetical. So um, Humana fires the- uh, person that does the Walgreens prescription, whatever this arbitration is about, um, because she's a woman. She wants to bring her Title VII claim. Can Humana say, no, 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 like this relates, or Walgreens, I guess I'm losing sort of track of who's the one trying to arbitrate here, but, you know, says, no, that relates to our business relationship. And I think if that's the case, it has to go to the arbitrator to decide whether that, that question can be arbitrated. And if so, I don't see how you know, this poor lady's Title VII suit can be litigated. Well, that question is ongoing. I think, Your Honor, that 
helps with what I was saying in the last hypothetical, which is that it may be that Humana would still in that situation, which I can represent Humana would never do. Um, but if Humana were to, or some other company or entity person, what have you, really did pursue a completely frivolous arbitration, they may be entitled to do that, but that does not mean that the Title VII litigation needs to end. So for example, in the uh, case cited by Walgreens in their brief, the Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission case, there was an arbitration agreement. The individual had raised an employment discrimination claim, and then the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission sought to litigate that claim. And there was an argument made that the EEOC could not do that because there was this arbitration agreement. But the EEOC by statute was entitled to continue to pursue in court that claim. So I think in these hypotheticals, which again, I, I, I hope that the court would not lose too much sleep over because they are so highly unlikely and not what's happening here. But also there, there, there's many procedural avenues that could be pursued. So for example, as your honor- I would have thought, leave, leave aside the procedure for a minute. I would have thought your answer would have been different. Um, and so tell me if you agree with this, which is that your position doesn't entail the conclusion that an objecting third party can be, a non-signatory objecting third party can be dragged to arbitration because an objecting non-signatory arbitra- uh, 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 non, an objecting non-signatory to the arbitration agreement uh, didn't agree to have it go to arbit. Unlike Humana, where Humana is uh, 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 at Walgreens, where Walgreens is the party being dragged to arbitration, if the objecting non-signatory, if someone's trying to drag the objecting non-signatory to arbitration, the, the, they can say, well, I don't really care what this agreement says because I didn't sign it. And Humana can't, and Walgreens can't say that because they both signed it. So it matters what it means. And one thing that it may mean is that any dispute about what it means uh, is for an arbitrator. Um, uh, so I would have thought that these third-party hypotheticals uh, wouldn't, uh, be susceptible to the idea that they could be lassoed or dragged against their objection into arbitration for that reason. Right. Yes, yes, Your Honor. And I apologize if I was not clear. That is completely accurate. There is no universe in which Humana, simply because it has an arbitration agreement with Walgreens, could drag a third party, or sorry, there may be a universe. I, you know, I don't want to limit it, but it is ha- unlikely, and that's certainly not what we're saying. So that's exactly why the Humana Walgreens arbitration agreement does not require Kroll and Mooring to arbitrate anything. So that, that is absolutely correct. The question is, or as I understood the hypotheticals, is, is there a scenario in which Humana could raise a frivolous claim that Walgreens has to somehow arbitrate some component of its dispute with this so third party? I, I, I understand. So you're saying, could they drag at least the Walgreens into arbitration right. on the topic of whether it committed a tort? Uh, uh, as against some unrelated third party. And your point is maybe, though, who would want to do that? And in any event, the litigation with the other party could presumably go forward. Yes, sir. Got it. Thank you. If this is the case, then does it really turn on whether the non-signatory third party consents or not? Because I I think, one, I I thought you had said earlier that it, it didn't turn on whether they consented or not. And then I guess, two, what about Walgreens right it never signed an agreement to arbitrate with a consenting third party and now it's being forced to adjudicate its dispute being shoehorned in other under a different arbitration agreement that it signed with a different party I, I I apologize I may have lost sight of what exactly the hypotheticals are because they're there I I do not mean to suggest that because an arbitration agreement exists between Humana and Walgreens that Humana or Walgreens can drag any other party with whom one of those entities has a dispute in court or otherwise into arbitration. That, so it, it, it's not That's about- That's sort of what happened here, right? Walgreens sues Kroll, third party, no, right? No. And then you move to send the injunction dispute between Walgreens and Kroll essentially to arbitration in Humana. And your point is, well, Kroll isn't required to do anything, but in order for the arbitrator, if they assume this is a question that needs to be arbitrated, to resolve the question, you need something from Kroll, right? Humana doesn't have the ability to determine what was in Kroll's files and what ethics rules Kroll may have breached in the course of their prior and, you know, wholly different relationship with Walgreens. So, Your Honor, the, there, what Walgreens was required to do by this order, if they wanted to, which they 
made the strategic decision not to, but was to raise the effort, so essentially a motion, to disqualify Kroll and Mooring in the arbitration. In that situation, Humana is still the party to the arbitration. And what would happen with such a motion? So if the arbitrator decided that it was arbitrable, then the arbitrator could decide on essentially infinite grounds the motion. So for example, that it's out of time which has nothing to do with the merits. Kroll and Mooring would not have to participate in any way. But in any event, even if the arbitrator did reach the merits, it's still humana arbitrating. This happens in litigation all the time. Motions to disqualify attorneys, the council obviously generally participate because they are representing the party, but they are not a party to that disqualification effort themselves. It is between the client and the opponent or or, or I guess the the court if they raise it to a sponte. so that the law firm or the attorney themselves is not going to be arbitrating in this situation. Humana is. And the grounds on which the arbitrator would decide such a motion had it been raised, again, this is a hypothetical that doesn't exist here, had such a disqualification effort been raised in the arbitration, it's, you know, it's impossible to know because it would be within the arbitrator's discretion how to handle that motion or effort. So this will be my, my last question. Um, we have to draw a line. I, I'm sympathetic that like you think that your case is so close to, so far away from the line that, that we don't have to. But what what would we say that doesn't sort of create this, this whole universe of hypothetical problems, but also still allows us to rule for you? I think it's dictated by the United States Supreme Court. Uh, and, and this court, I mean, looking at Jean Bain, it's dictated by this court as well. If two parties, have agreed to arbitrate and there's a broad arbitration provision and arbitrability is committed to the arbitrator, the court is without authority to decide that question. If I may, uh, I want to just mention a few more things. Um, So one, to, to keep in mind and going back to the idea that the rules of professional conduct, that attorney discipline, all of these ethical issues that are very relevant here, both in a disqualification effort, as well as in the underlying claims that, again, Humana is not participating in that are ongoing in superior action, is the protection of the client. And looking at how disqualification motions typically happen, they are decided in the proceeding in which disqualification is sought. So as, as your honors were asking earlier, whether there are other actions in which Walgreens is litigating and Cole is representing another health insurance carrier, that is in the record, and it is happening. Walgreens is in the Northern District of Illinois in federal court against Blue Cross and Blue Shield, which Pearl and Mooring is also representing. And there's a reason, most likely, why Walgreens doesn't want to emphasize that and didn't in their preliminary injunction motion specifically mention what other, you know, or or, I believe the language is or otherwise, uh, relief that they're seeking is because this would be completely backwards for in, in our judicial system for litigation to be ongoing where counsel is representing a party, for the other party to seek to disqualify that counsel in a completely separate court, in a completely separate jurisdiction, that would simply not occur. The Superior Court would not issue an injunction uh, barring Kroll and Mooring from continuing to participate in litigation in a completely separate jurisdiction. So while this appeal is on an order compelling arbitration, the impact implications of what Walgreens is arguing are not limited to the arbitration context. This would allow a party like Walgreens to file a court or file an action in a completely separate court, not name the actual client and interest, Humana here, at all in that action, oppose intervention. Uh, and this requires, again, as, as, as I, I apologize, I don't re- uh, recall which of your honors mentioned this, but it is highly disruptive to the arbitration proceeding. Of course it is. To take to remove Humana's choice of counsel on the eve of the trial, almost two years into arbitration and and not name them, Humana had to hire outside counsel. We are, I do not represent Humana in the arbitration, had to file a motion to intervene. All right, I said that I was done with questions, but but I'm not, unfortunately. Um, There's a lot of gamesmanship all over the place, right? So like, yeah, eve of arbitration, they think they're gonna lose, they try and like 
you know, boot out your counsel, they file a lawsuit against the third party, you know, you try and intervene and then you decide, actually, I'm just going to go and, and file a, you know, Humana versus Walmart greens and kick this to arbitration. But like, let's say, you know, we disbar your counsel on the eve of arbitration because they did something bad. It hurts you. It, it affects your arbitration. It's real bad. It doesn't mean that you get to then go into arbitration over it, though. Yes, Your Honor, that, that's correct. It's, it's not we, we get to arbitrate simply because we want to. It's because this dispute is at least plausibly, and we think certainly, but plausibly subject to the arbitration agreement versus a disciplinary proceeding would not be. And just like we are discussing with the employment case or the EEOC case specifically, that's a separate track, a separate basis on which claims or, or, or these questions could be decided. So again, to, to reiterate, the DC Superior Court action is ongoing. Walgreens is pursuing its breach of fiduciary duty claim. This order compelling arbitration does not affect that action. And so similarly, this court, if it were to you know, suspend or, or, or disbar or what have you, uh, any entity's counsel, then yes, that would likely have an impact in the arbitration, it's not that arbitration can never be disrupted, uh, but it has to have, there have to be valid grounds for it, certainly. Um, I, I will not go deep into Jahan Bain, but I would like to distinguish that case and just make sure that it is clear that uh, as, as Judge Beckwith was pointing out, that was a question about whether the arbitration agreement between the condominium, condominium association and each of the unit owners drew in the unit owners as direct parties. So one, you don't have a situation here where Humana is a third party beneficiary to an arbitration agreement. It is the direct party to the arbitration agreement it has with Walgreens, nor does the court need to interpret whether there's some ambig ambiguous language in the arbitration agreement that makes the two parties direct parties. Here, there's no question whatsoever. It is completely undisputed that Humana and Walgreens are the parties to the arbitration agreement that is dictating the outcome as the Superior Court properly determined. And uh, as a final note, uh, unless there are further questions, the cases that uh, Mr. Robinson and Walgreens cite, both in their brief and then in argument, specifically Dean Winter Reynolds, there's also Morgan Stanley. Uh, those are two cases that are completely distinguishable from what's happening here. Uh, we would also posit wrongly decided, but in any event, they did not have, again, the direct parties to the arbitration agreement seeking to compel arbitration. In both of those cases, it was the law firm. So it would be akin to if Kroll and Mooring had sought to compel arbitration in the underlying action, that is not what is occurring here. Humana is the party that moved to compel arbitration. Additionally, there was no discussion of or analysis of arbitrability questions. So there's, there may or may not have been an arbitrability provision within the agreements governing those disputes, but there certainly is one here. And there's no analysis of that question in those cases, which also were decided before uh, Henry Schein. Um, and if there are no further questions, we would ask that the court affirm the superior courts uh, order compelling arbitration. Thank you, Ms. Jonas. Um, Mr. Robinson, we'll give you three minutes or so for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. I want to make three points. The first point is if you actually look at the courts, the Superior Court's order, what we were ordered to do was not go to an arbitrator to move to disqualify. What we were ordered is we were ordered to arbitrate its request that Kroll and Mooring be enjoined from representing Humana in the ongoing arbitration. Okay, so how can you say that Kroll and Mooring is not being dragged into the arbitration when there's no agreement between by Kroll or by Walgreens to arbitrate disputes about personal uh, professional responsibility? Obviously, Kroll, and, Kroll is the star of the arbitration if we have to do that. They have to participate. They have to prove that they didn't or that they didn't engage in ethical misconduct. There's no way to say that these third parties aren't being dragged in by the theory that Humana is trying to sell to the court in this proceeding. Second point I wanted to make. I guess maybe a thread that is missing from your argument, and I want to make sure it's one you are making, is the order says that Walgreens is compelled to arbitrate its request that's against Kroll and Mooring from the Superior Court suit. 
Correct. Right. And Walgreens has never said that it was going to arbitrate anything with Pearl and Murray. Exactly. Exactly. And the reason, you know, we had good reason to bring a lawsuit in the D.C. Superior Court against Kroll and Mooring. Kroll and Mooring is a D.C. law firm. Their headquarters are here in Washington, D.C. Most of their attorneys are licensed and subject to the rules of the District of Columbia. The District of Columbia judiciary is the best place to decide whether Kroll and Mooring violated its ethical obligations or not. Now, with respect to the issue of arbitrability, even the Henry Schein case says that the first, before you even get to arbitrability, you have to decide whether there is an arbitration agreement between the parties. And Judge McLeese, you asked the question about, I think it was you who said, who are the parties that we're talking about here? And I believe it's the parties to the dispute that somebody is trying to compel into arbitration. In this case, it would be the why, parties. Why would that, uh, I, um, I mean, I'd have to go back and look at the context of that particular quote, but if you're trying to figure out, the first thing you're trying to figure out if there is an agreement to arbitrate would be look at the agreement and see who the party, the alleged parties are, and if there's an agreement between those two parties. Well, I think what you would do is you would look at first at who are the parties to the dispute. In this case, the parties to the dispute are Walgreens and Kroll and Mooring. And then you look to see, uh, is there an arbitration agreement between them? Okay, I'm, now you got me really confused. So let's say that I sign an arbitration agreement with you where I say, I will uh, agree to arbitrate any dispute between you and me, um, and also any dispute between you and uh, you know some uh, third person. Um, you say you would first look to the dispute, who, who are the parties to the dispute? And you well, would see whether they were, so again, imagine I sued the third party um, and so who's not a signatory, but the agreement expressly says, I agree to arbitrate any dispute you and I might have involving that third party. Well, we don't have, first of all, we don't have an agreement here that says anything about third parties. I, I understand that. I'm just uh, I'm trying to understand your argument about what the order of operations is. Okay, the order of, okay. No, no, first no, you look, no, hold on, counsel. Let me just ask my question. Right. Here's the question. You're saying the first thing I do is I, if I've got a dispute in front of me and somebody's saying, oh, this should be arbitrated, I have to look and see. The first thing I do is I figure out whether there's a, 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 an agreement to arbitrate between the two parties to the dispute. Yes. At the end, no, I'm done. If that's your theory, I get puzzled because there could be an arbitral agreement between me and some other person. Uh, uh, that, that says that I will arbitrate disputes that relate to some third party. Um, okay. So I don't, I don't quite understand. That suggests that I could never agree to arbitrate anything that isn't a dispute between me and the person I'm agreeing to arbitrate with. No, you I could. could you, to a broader arbitration agreement, then I, I don't see why I would stop at figuring out, was there an agreement between the two parties to the dispute? I need to figure out I mean, it may be relevant who the parties to the dispute are, the litigation, or, uh, uh, but I think at the end of the day, what, whatever the answer to that question is, you then need to go look at the arbitration agreement, see who the parties to that were, see what they agreed, and if one of the parties to the dispute agreed to, uh, with some, somebody else to arbitrate, then you may be required to arbitrate. I, I just don't see why you would stop without looking at the agreement and just say no arbitration agreement can compel arbitration between two people who are in a dispute and where not where both of them were not signatories to the agreement. I don't get that. Because we don't have an arbitration agreement here where Walgreens ever agreed with Humana to arbitrate its claims against third parties. That just doesn't exist. We have and we have no agreement between Walgreens and Kroll and Mooring to arbitrate disputes. So we have you have to look the dispute in this case is walgreens against kroll and mooring there is and you have to then the next step once you've said all right that's our dispute walgreens can i ask you a question about that so it, let's let's assume that uh at the end of the day there is a determination that crow and mooring should never have been representing um humana in this arbitration Right. Are you saying you, you will see you intend to seek no relief uh, with respect to the substantive out of, uh, outcome of that uh, arbitration? So it, this is not just not relevant to your dispute between uh, with Humana. 
you have no dispute with Humana. If Humana wants to have Crowell Mori as its counsel, that's fine with you. And you're not going to try to undo the arbitration in this case on that ground uh, at the end of the day, if you ended up prevailing, because this has nothing to do with your arbitration with Humana. Is that right? No, I'm not saying it has nothing to do with the arbitration with Humana. What I'm saying is that our cause of action is against is against uh, Kroll and Mori. And the person, the party that we're, we're holding, we're, going, we're seeking to hold responsible for the ethical misconduct is Kroll and Mori. And so to then say, well, you've got to convince, now I've got to convince an arbitrator that my claim against Kroll and Mori is meritorious. I never agreed to do that. I never agreed to present my ethical disputes between my between Walgreens and Kroll and Mooring to anybody other than a judicial forum. And if you're right, theoretically, an arbitrator will agree with you. And if the arbitrator gets that way wrong, you might get judicial review. But your opponent's argument is you did agree to have arbitrator decide the scope of your arbitral agreement with Humana. That's so it gets around in circles, but so it's just right. a funny case. It just depends where you start and. Uh, uh, where you where you start is where you end up. That that's that's right. But I think you know we go back to the you know even Henry Schein says you first have to determine that the parties agreed to arbitrate their dispute, and here the dispute is between us and Kroll and Mooring. We never asked to arbitrate. We never agreed to arbitrate that. According to the district, the, the superior court's decision, even if we had refused to arbitrate that those disputes with and mooring, we could still be forced to do that. And that just isn't the law. Thank you, Your Honors. On that note, all right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Robinson and Ms. Jonas for your briefing and your arguments today. Um, we'll take the case under advisement and uh, you are free to log out and we're adjourned. Thank you. This court is now adjourned.